Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. This is an important announcement for anyone who wants to advertise here on Everyone Loves Guitar. Over the last nine months alone, we've had 425,000 more downloads, added over 25,000 monthly listens, and grown our YouTube subscriber base by 72 times. During this time, we've kept our advertising rates consistent, but we will be increasing rates on January 1st. So if you're a business looking to generate new leads or increase your cash flow by picking up new clients or customers, or if you're a label looking to promote new music, then listen up. For information on advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, fill in the short form at everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Again, that's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Even if you want to advertise next year, you'll get to lock into marketing your product or service at the current rates before rates go up at the end of this year. You know, much of your success as an online business, especially with guitars, will depend on your domain name. The owner of two great guitar domain names has contacted me and he has them for sale. Those two domain names are guitarbuyers.com and cashforguitars.com. Call or email them at the contact information listed on that page and they will give you 20% off the purchase price. In addition, they'll work with you to make payments if that's what you need. Again, that's guitarbuyers.com and cashforguitars.com. If you want to buy or sell a home or investment property and you're here in the Tampa Bay area, in Hillsboro, Pinellas, or Pasco counties, then listen up. West Florida Real Estate is a local residential real estate broker that's helped over 250 Bay Area homeowners buy and sell their properties in the last four years alone. If you're looking to sell, you'll want to get their free report, The 7 Biggest Mistakes Homeowners Make When Hiring a Realtor. And if you're looking to buy a property, you definitely want to get your hands on The 21 Most Expensive Mistakes Tampa Home Buyers Make When Buying a Home. Each one of these reports is going to save you time and money. Inside, you'll discover the 7 Most Important Things to Consider When Hiring a Realtor, what to do if you're buying and selling a home at the same time, and the danger of choosing a realtor who agrees with everything you say. To get your hands on these free reports, head on over to westfloridarealestate.com. That's westfloridarealestate.com. Hey, this is Craig. If you like this show and you want to support it and you want to keep it free, head on over to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. Hey, everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And man, I've got a great guest today. He's not only a brilliant guitar player, he's a brilliant guy, really good conversationalist, got a lot of stuff going on, great work ethic, been around forever. And uh, he's the man, Frank Marino, the one and only from Frank Marino Mahogany Rush. Uh, Before we get started, I just want to say a shout out. Thank you to Mario Bifferali from Godan for um, connecting us. Quick background on Frank, and then we'll get right into this. Originally from Montreal, Canada, half Italian, half Arabic. He's one of five children. God bless your parents. His early experimentation with LSD led him to what was to become the definition of his life. He couldn't really understand when it finally caught up with him, gave him such an incredibly vivid experience that was overwhelming. It was so overwhelming, it actually landed him in the psych ward of the Montreal Children's Hospital. That was a good place because that's where he first picked up the guitar and it helped his recovery. Shortly after that, he formed Mahogany Rush, a trio playing rock, psychedelic, funky, bluesy music of the late 60s and early 70s. Since then, Frank's released seven solo records, 12 albums with Mahogany Rush, and he's got a really cool brand new six-hour six-hour DVD box set with tons of cool material in it. He's also got a 180-page book personally curated and put together by Frank. If you've never seen Frank, this is the only chance you will get to see him. Uh, The DVD is called Frank Marino Live at the Agora, and we're going to talk about that. Um, If you are not familiar with Frank's playing, I would suggest you go listen to the album called Live by Frank Marino Mahogany Rush. Crank it up. And man, honestly, no 
blowing smoke up Frank's ass, but listen to one of the most talented guitar players you'll ever hear playing fun and yet very serious rock and roll. Frank, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on. Nice to be here, Craig. Nice to talk to you. Likewise, man. Uh, your bio said that you left school like after seventh grade. <laughs> yeah, I was actually enrolled in high school, but I uh, didn't really go. I went 28 days or 26 or 28 days and that was like in half day periods <laughs> and um so i was i was like enrolled but never really went and and then i got my mind blown on uh you know on the acid and then i really never went <laughs> so <laughs> i really never went to high school so i never really had that experience but uh you know later on i i got this thirst for learning stuff so i just started teaching myself things so Maybe I didn't need to go to the high school after all, you know? <laughs> no. Well, you could always tell. I don't know. I mean, I've always noticed you could always tell people that are really well read because they speak very well. I've noticed that anyway. And like, it's the first time I talked to you. I had no idea, nor did I care about your educational background, but I, I just knew. I said, man, this guy is really well read because it's just the way you spoke. So I think, look, put point is this everybody learns everything on authority, right? So yeah. that means like some author wrote something that you then read. So yeah. I don't think there's anything, not that much that we've actually proven or experienced ourselves. It's usually, you know, how do the Spanish Armada think? Well, uh, we take their word for it. So we read stuff and, um, you know, that's, it's always reading. So when you figure it out, really libraries have been around for a long time. So if you, if you really want to learn anything, just go read books. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> You'll find man. out. Absolutely. Yeah. All righty. You first picked up the guitar when you were in the hospital recovering from a lot of LSD. How did you get good at guitar and when did you start writing your own stuff? Well, look, like what happens, what happened with me was I, I had played drums. You know, I had been a kid who played drums. I was into drums. I, I liked music. I liked the Beatles, you know, <laughs> I was, it was the sixties mm -hmm. and, um, I was a little bit young to be um, experimenting with those kind of drugs, but of course it was the sixties and I had older brothers yeah. and sisters, well, older brother and older sister and friends that were older than me. So I was kind of a kid mascot type of deal. Mm -hmm. You know, you see, if you look at the Woodstock movie, you actually see that too. You see the, these um, obvious people in their twenties that have little kid brothers and stuff with them that look like they're eight years old. You know, yeah. you see that in the crowd. So I was like one of those guys. And, um, when you, when you, when you go as far as I did on, you know, unexpectedly, as far as I did on that particular drug, um, the way that it works out is it's so, it's so freaky. In my case, it was so just terribly freaky, um, that you really need to focus on anything other than that. So being that I was going through that and being that the, the uh, let's say distraction at that time happened to be that there was a guitar in that hospital. Um, couldn't obviously if there had been drums there, it would have been bashing on those. But I don't think they put drums in a hospital. Yeah. And uh, so you know, I just I just stuck to it like glue, and I I just I just always always invented stuff on it. And the other thing that was very odd about it was when you're in that state of mind. Um, especially as deeply as I was in that state of mind and for so long, you don't really know the difference at that time. You don't really know the difference as to whether what you're thinking about is something you heard or something you thought up. Right. So I was thinking of all the music that I had heard, you know, in our group of friends and stuff like that. And really thinking that I was going to, you know, oh, I think I'll work on my songs, you know, like this totally crazy sort of, I'll play my, I'll play the guitar and do more songs. Like that's how you're thinking. It's almost like when, you know, when you dream, Yeah. when you dream, you're a character in that dream, you don't really get to decide unless you're having a very lucid dream. You don't really get to decide what you think you might or might not do. The character decides it's almost like the script is written in the dream. Yeah. And your character follows that script. So you might be afraid of something in a dream that you're never really actually afraid of in life. But in the dream, you're cast as being afraid of it. Or you might like something in a dream that you wouldn't normally like in life. But in that dream, you're cast as that. Well, 
when you go into as deep an LSD experience um, that that some people do, it's not just about anymore about wow, does this feel cool or you know wow, I feel high or ha ha ha. That's the early stuff. But when you finally get deep deeply into that type of I guess psychosis, um, you just you live out a dream, and the dream is the story that your mind or whatever is inventing, and you're that character. Until you eventually begin to realize, wait a minute, I'm, I'm supposed to be in the, the other world. Like, where am I? And that's roughly what took so long for me to come back from. And during that period, the guitar was really the only way. I didn't really care about guitar. It wasn't like, wow, I want to play a guitar or be in a band. It just happened to be the thing that I grabbed and latched onto. And I was so terrified in that script of everything else in that dream. If you look at my early album covers, those are basically drawings of where I was, oh, uh, artist conception of where I was, um, that you just cling to whatever you can. And you just imagine you were thrown overboard on, on a ship or something, and there was a piece of wood. You just sort of cling to that piece of wood, like it, wood never meant so much to you as it does in that situation. And so, yeah, anybody, it's not just me, it, it's not really a talent thing. It's more like a necessity that anybody who does anything that in that with that much focus is going to naturally make it second nature to them. So there's a lot of musicians out there who understand. Let, let, let me give an example. If I go and I give a guitar, if I, if I go meet a guitar player in a music store, for instance, and I say, um, Hey, try this guitar, and I hand it to him. The first thing he's going to do, let's say he's a rock player, he's going to grab the guitar, and his hand is going to automatically play like an E major. Right. It's just natural. He's going to go there and play that first position and go bang, and he's going to he's strum that chord. Now, when he first played guitar, it was really hard for him to play that E major. It was probably even harder for him to play that D major in the first position, which is like, you know, you have to sort of twist your fingers a little bit to do it. Yep. But now that it became second nature to him, he almost can't hold an instrument without going to that position. It's so second nature to him that it just goes there. And, and even if you take that guy and you say, now here's the same guitar. You have all this knowledge. Now you've developed all this second nature knowledge. You can play E, G, D. You can play lead solos. You can do all kinds of things that are all second nature to you. Now we're going to take the guitar. We're going to flip it around left-handed and give it to you, the same guy that knows the same things, all of a sudden he can't play them. Correct. But he knows how to play them, but his hand doesn't do it. But if he begins to practice that way, sooner or later he becomes the same guitar player, left-handed. Yeah. So you focus on something, it's the mind that's really thinking this stuff up, and the body's just sort of following. So if you focus on something so much, anything, could be guitar, could be being a surgeon, whatever, you're going to get pretty darn good at it because it's going to become second nature. So the, the drug experience sort of causes or caused me to focus on nothing else but that every waking hour of my day. And when I finally got out of the hospital, while well, I was in and out a few times, I came out with this like knowledge of this, this ability to sort of do these things at that point. And then, of course, my mother, my parents were you know, old school parents who'd never even heard of drugs, you know? And so when they, you know, it was a shock for them to have to put me in a hospital and then go through all that. And so when I came out, of course, they wanted to do, my mother wanted to do whatever she could to sort of make me not be screaming and freaking out and afraid. So she said, well, he seems to like the guitar. They didn't let me take the guitar with me out of the hospital. So she got me one. Oh. And she okay. figured, okay, I'll get you this guitar. This guy, this kid down the street is selling one. Happened to be an electric guitar. And it happened to be a Gibson SG Les Paul 61, which today is worth a lot of money, but then was worth 75 bucks. Okay. So she got that for me, and I just sat with that guitar all the time. And if I would go out to a park, which I was afraid to do, I would take it with me. Wherever I'd go, I'd take it with me. Go to bed, I'd take it with me. Sure. And that's how you eventually, it becomes second nature to you. So what does that mean? What does second nature mean in terms of playing a guitar? 
or any instrument. What it means is this. When you are young, when you're a child, you learn to talk before you learn to read. You learn that by osmosis. You know, people around you um, talk. So you imitate and then you talk. At first you talk funny and then you talk better. And you learn how to talk and say things long before they show you how to read them or spell them or write them. Sure. So then you learn the technical side. So when you do want to talk, uh, okay. a thought comes to your head, your tongue forms it. You don't have to think, I think I should form my W's like this with my mouth. It's second nature. Right. Now, when you do that with a musical instrument, that same thing happens. You get proficient, not to the point where you're able to say, I'm choosing to do a, you know, a scale or play something by Rachmaninoff, but you want to say something mentally, just like a word, but your hand does what your tongue would do if you wanted to speak. So you're not thinking about it. It's just doing it because of the way you start it. And that's essentially how I approach the instrument. So to this day. So, for instance, if I want to, if you if you let me join your band, and you say, Frank, we're we're covering a bunch of tunes by I don't know, we're we're having fun, we're going to play some of these songs, and I've never let's say played them before, I don't have to like take the song and say, okay, let's see, I have to play this way, and then you know start figuring it out. I just have to listen to it enough times so that I can memorize it in my mind, and then just like you'd be able to memorize words from a song and then your tongue will speak them if i memorize music my hand will do it totally. it's the same kind of connection now i believe that anybody can do that some people think it's you know unique to me that i have that ability but i don't think it's unique to me i think it's i think everybody can do that i just think most people don't really want to bother they'd yeah. rather read a tab or, or read sheet music or go to a guitar teacher or something so Consequently, my playing doesn't really ever get any different than it needs to be at the moment. In other words, I don't care whether or not I can play something amazing that someone else can. Like I happen to think there's a lot of some pretty technically amazing players in the world, but I'm not, I don't bother saying I think I'd like to learn that so that I could be that good. I don't care. Sure. So if I play something, it's just because I want to express thought. And if it's not fast enough or not good enough or not as good as the next guy, that's okay. You know, like I don't speak like him either. Yeah, yeah. So totally that's, you, you get what I'm saying? So 100%. it's so natural. I've never practiced in my life. I could never understand ever. I could never understand how someone would say, well, I got to go practice now. Like, Da, 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 get it faster with the <laughs> metronome and all that stuff, you know? I can't understand that. Like, I'm not, I've never done it. And even with a band, I've never had a band practice. I've had a lot of, you know, Mahogany Rush had a lot of, you know, sitting in a room and jamming, which we still do every sound check and every show, but that's practice. Sure. But it's not like, okay, guys, uh, you know, I've seen it happen with other bands. You know, let's get the punches right to know oh, this four bars to this before we do this. And, oh, no, that wasn't tight enough. Let's do it again. I I can't live that way. So I'm you're just, playing. I'm just yeah. not that way. It's just you're just playing. It's yeah. like you're just talking. You're having a conversation. And, and no one practices a conversation. It's like that would be weird. Yeah, I totally I mean, you'd, you'd be writing. If you were practicing a conversation, you'd be reading someone else's script. It wouldn't be your own conversation. It'd be more like a monologue or something. So that's, that's the approach. And LSD, well, I guess what that did was it put me in such a mental state that it was necessary to find that way back, to find the way home, as I say, find the answer. I wrote a song about it. And eventually, you know, it doesn't come overnight. It took me 10, 15 years to try to get back to a kind of semblance of reality. And you see it in the very early, early albums. Oh, wow. Or some of the things I'm writing and saying are like so out there. You say, well, this guy's got to be crazy or something. You know, I, I look back at the way I was expressing certain things and I understand why I said them, why I made, you know, I had words like Maxum and Mahogany Rush and <laughs> some of the words I said in songs. I get it now. But at the time, it was just natural for me to call them those things like in a dream, exactly like in a dream. 
Oh, you're living a dream, basically. So how? So it took you a long time to to get back to some sort of clarity. Well, clarity starts coming. It becomes it becomes interspersed, like the reality. If people who've gone through this, there are people listening to this who are nodding their heads and going, "I went through that." I know what that, what he means by that. It's really hard to explain it to people that don't know that. That's why doctors really never have the ability to help people that are going through this, and they try giving them drugs. You know, they'll give them Thorazine or whatever, try to you know bring them back, but bring them back to what? I mean, here's the deal: imagination is is like a very very powerful thing. You know, imagination. Yeah, definitely. And let's say I let's say I would take you we're going on a drive and uh, we, we drive by this mountain every day on our way to work or whatever. And I happen to point out to you one day, it's a mountain you've passed all the time. I happen to point out to you, oh, you see the peak on that mountain, it, it looks like an elephant or a rocking horse or something. You go, I don't know. I don't see that. I don't see that. And all of a sudden you see it. Mm-hmm. You go, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. I get it. It's called a eureka moment. You know, you get that sure. aha moment. Yeah. Now, let me ask you if you can ever drive by that again and not see it. No, you'd always see it every time you drive by. But what you saw wasn't really the elephant or the rocking horse. What you saw was the geometry that then made you see the geometry in a different way. So if you look around at reality, if you right now in the room you're in, look at, point your head in one direction, there's a lot of lines there. Of course, there's yeah. the edge of the table and the wall and there's pictures on the wall. There's all kinds of geometry in front of your eyes at all times. If you take a photograph of that geometry, of that picture, and then you take a pen, you could probably draw with a pen using only the lines that are in that picture. By connecting them in a different way, yeah. you could draw a different figure. Uh, yeah, Say, so, well, I need an upright line. Here's one. I need an angled line. Here's one. And you start connecting them and you end up drawing, I don't know, a dog or something. Mm-hmm. So what LSD or any of these drugs is doing is it's making your mind see the world that is the world, but connecting things in a different way. So your imagination begins to connect. This is kind of like an interspersion of reality and unreality. What I had to do was I had to learn without having any help. Cause it was the sixties. Okay. I didn't really know a lot about this then. I mean, one point the drug was even legal you know um i had to sort of figure out what i what am i living what am i seeing what am i thinking i'm hearing and how is it connecting with the real world so what happens is your dream begins to become interconnected with the actual world you live in and that's when you say you know what i need to get back to the actual world like i don't like this way of looking at the geometry <laughs> scaring the shit out of me really yeah. And so you begin to say, okay, and you're trying to drag yourself back to the other way of, let's say, not seeing that rocking horse anymore or that elephant. Yeah, yeah. And that's the hard part. That's the really hard part because you want so much to get back to what you know is some form of sanity that you're automatically assuming you must be insane to not be able to do it. And that's even more scary than than the things you seem to think you're imagining, you're feeling or seeing. It's the, it's the wish to survive. So anything that gets you there, whether it's reading books, uh, uh, playing instruments, learning about new things that you didn't learn before, whether I, you know, I learned electronics and I learned physics and I learned car mechanics and I went racing and I did all kinds of things. It was always the same thing. Occupy your mind with something else and then find out how that something else is sort of fitting in. And sooner or later, what happens is that other world goes away, but doesn't ever really go away. You can always sort of see it again if you want to, but you really don't want to. So you focus on the other experience, the other side of it. And that's how I live today. It's been 50 years ago that this happened to me. Well, 51 now. And I can still see it and I can still feel it and I can still hear it, but I choose not to. And the long journey that got me here, all the stuff I learned, whether it was technical stuff or spiritual stuff, I'm a religious guy. That's, that was all started as out of necessity. Necessity is truly the mother of invention. Yeah. I agree with you 100% on that. Man. So now you, you understand the whole LSD relationship because people think, 
oh, Frank Marino, man, was a crazy drug user, dude. And he just was like, you know, really, now he's sober. And I hear that word all the time. I'm not sober. I haven't done anything since I was 14 years old. I haven't had a drink and I haven't had a drug. Yeah. But it doesn't mean I wasn't high <laughs> so, <laughs> from the experience. So let me ask you this, and, and we'll move on after this, but what what good – because I, how did this help you? Because I get the sense that in some way it really did help me. What What are the good things that came out of that for you? Well, everything, everything that I am. But you see, there's a danger in saying that because now people think, oh, gee, I think I'll just go take <laughs> magic drugs and <laughs> all, you know, all this up. good stuff's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, let me tell you something. This is, I would... I would tell everybody who might be listening to me, it's really not good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You don't, you really don't need to do that. Like I know people say, Oh, you don't need to do that. You can get high on music, man. You can get high on people. You can get high on life. Well, that's kind of an oversimplification, but it's really not the way to do it. I got lucky Yeah. because I could have just very, very as easily. And many friends I know, stayed in that hospital yeah slipped in there and not come back and not had something yeah. to hang on to that was a it's branch the between the yeah. worlds yeah yeah it's only by the grace of god yeah that i was able to come back like i didn't come back i didn't make myself come back you know there's a there, i believe in the higher power sure. and sometimes that helps you and this is what i think happened and i don't know why that higher power which i call god uh, I'm not one of these, you know, I worship the creation instead of the creator guys. Um, <laughs> the universe, oh, the universe, as if the universe is thinking. You know, no, I'm not, I'm not that. I'm not an animist. You know, Frank, listen, but don't hold that, back. I, don't hold yeah, back. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that thing, that thing for me is extremely real. It's not an invention of LSD. It was here before I was. It's as real as the multiplication table, it's an objective truth. An objective truth, uh, the ratio of a circle is an objective truth. You can't, it's an objective truth whether you like it or you're not, or you're dead or you're alive. The ratio of a circle is the ratio of a circle. Mathematics uh -huh. to me is like objectively true. Yes. And, and so is God. So is the, the present. You know, that is objectively true. So in some people's lives, and I don't know why, you get helped. And in some people's lives, tragically, we see they don't. No one is to blame for some reason that we don't understand. I was kidnapped as a baby, and they caught me at the end of the street, caught the guy. Are you right serious? out of my high chair. Yeah. I was uh, I pulled out of my high chair. A man ran away with me down to the end of the street. And if not for the women saying to my mother, Dolly, my mother's name was Dolly, Dolly, someone just stole your kid. And they all ran after him at the end of the street. They grabbed him and beat him up, and he wouldn't let go of the baby. And they finally did, and he ran away. Holy so what shit. happens if the lady doesn't see that man? Yeah, right. Am I talking to you today? No, probably not. So, so these events, for some reason, in people's lives, they, they change everything. They change everything. Now, I think that's God. I think there's a plan for that. I don't know the plan. <laughs> it's not like I know the plans. Right. Many, a lot of Christians will tell you, yes, God and Lord and this, and they give you this sweet kind of Ned Flanders Christianity and, you know, give you slogans. And they think, they, you know, they act as if they know it all, but they don't. Sometimes you just have to be able to say that I don't know what I don't know, and I'll wait to find out. And that's sort of my life, and that's what it's been for all my life, even before the drugs. So let me ask you this, because I, I, if you if you're okay talking about it, because I'm interested in this right now, as a matter of fact. So yeah, because then I'm, you should be. Yeah, it's good for you. I, yeah, because <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out all these things and where they sit for me. Do mm. you think you you made a comment? A few minutes ago, and again, if you don't want to talk about this, that's cool. Just, I, I listen. Just, I'm if you if you if you're going into theology, that's something I prefer to talk about more than anything. So I know <laughs> listeners don't like to hear it, but no, that's no. my whole life. <laughs> Not theology. That's the way I. No, uh, <laughs> uh, more spirituality. Do you? No, no, no. Don't do that, Craig. What? 
Don't do that. Look, I don't know don't theology. Don't make that mistake. No, don't, don't make that mistake. I don't know theology. See, spirituality. People say that. Spirituality okay. without actually figuring out what does that mean. Oh, well, that's what I'm trying what to figure out. What does that mean? I don't know. Yeah. That's what I'm, I'm trying to figure out. I'm, I'm just being totally oh, okay. brutally honest let, with you. Let me I give you know. a logical conclusion. Let me yeah. use logic. Because we don't have to use just, you know, oh, just belief. Okay. You can use logic <laughs> for this. Okay. You can actually use a logical way of approaching it. You're, frank, you're and, great, man. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. So if we say spirituality, are we not then sort of saying to ourselves, there's something called a spirit? Well, yeah. That we don't know. Right. Yeah, so now course. we're automatically saying that there's, a, now obviously that spirit's not us. Of course. We can't be focusing on something if it's, if it's already there, if right. it's not already there. So mathematicians will tell you, and they will tell you, they never invent a principle, mathematical formula. They, they discover mathematical formulas. Correct. So discovering mathematical formulas implies that that formula was there before they discovered it. Something can't be discovered unless it was already there. <laughs> yes. Just using the word discover. Okay, means it was there, I found it. I go into the woods, yeah. I see rocks, I see trees, I expect to. All of a sudden, I see a Coke can. I say, hey, a person was here right? because right. it's a Coke can. Yeah. That thing didn't grow out of the ground. <laughs> so, so when people say, well, you know, I'm not really into the God thing, but I'm spiritual. Now, all of a sudden, they're saying there's a spirit. No, I'm not saying so that. So we have to go down that road and say, okay, what is that spirit? What does that mean when we talk about that? We sense a spirit. Now we need to go down that road because we said so. And all we need to find out about that is whether or not it's imaginary or objectively true. If it's imaginary, we can, like my acid trip is just another way of looking at geometry. We could say, okay, put it aside. It's just another way of looking at geometry. But if we find out that it's objectively true, it becomes the most important thing in the world. Okay, so let me ask you this. You mentioned the word help a few yeah, minutes help. back. Do you think that wanting help or asking for help is what led you to discover God for you? Uh, absolutely. A hundred percent. Okay. A hundred percent. Not just me. You see, here's the problem with help. People are so proud. It's inherent. We're proud. Let's face it. We're proud of everything. We're proud when our kids do something nice. That it's almost like humbling to, to ask something that one doesn't see for help. It's admitting weakness. Sure. Now, here's the deal about that. If goodness is actually a thing, right? Right. And badness, is, for lack of a better word, is actually a thing, right? <laughs> right? We all want goodness. Everybody seems to want good. And even bad people want goodness, yeah. okay? They want good a things, ain't right? That funny, yeah. So people aspire to that, right? They, they really want that. They know that from the time they're children. There's no such thing as an evil baby. Right. In, evil infants don't exist. Correct. So what evil is, is not what is something, but what people do. People do evil things. They're not, people are not evil inherently. They're inherently good right. because they're born inherently good. Every in infant is born inherently good. And the Bible says every time God does something, because then God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good every time he does something. So goodness is inherent in what we are. Whether you believe in God or not, we see that just by looking at the world. Okay, look at, go, go in a hospital. Look at all the newborn babies. You see, they're inherently good. Yeah. There's no evil there. But yet we know that every evil, every person we can, you know, conclude is evil today, whether it's Hitler or Stalin or whatever, at some point they were saying, mommy, ice cream, mommy, cookie. They were little babies. <laughs> they were inherently good. Can't imagine Adolf Hitler saying, mommy, cookie, mommy, and smiling and being cute. Right? right. But it's true. Right. We don't need to believe that it's true. Mm. It's objectively true. Sure. So once you start from that point. Let's say you accept that point without saying, let's argue for the sake of arguing. Then you begin to have to ask a different set of questions. Because if that is true, that means that when you were ostensibly good, you didn't have the pride. 
You didn't have the ego. You didn't have all of the things that make you think you're so self-important. So any goodness you did couldn't have been of your own accord. You didn't have the mind to be, say, I think I'll go out and do this good stuff today when you were that good infant. Mm -hmm. So any good that you did do had to have come from another source because you did do good and yet you didn't know it. So what was the source? Everything has a source. It's that's just cause and effect. So what was the source of that goodness? As we get older, we begin to say, we are the source. We're not actually the source. Because we if we were, we'd have known what we were doing when we did good before we knew what we were doing. Right. That's, I understand. What you're so saying. mathematically, that doesn't work. So what was the source? Now, here's why it's important to ask for help. A person who asks automatically puts himself in the position where he is admitting he's more humble than he was. He's humiliating himself. And the more, you know, not terribly, but he is, in effect, humiliating himself, making himself humble. By doing that, the source, whatever that source you want to call it, it can act through you the way it acted through you before. So the good that you do is not you giving anything to God, but God giving something to you. The reward you receive is the goodness you do. It's not like you do goodness and then get a reward for it. The goodness say, itself say, is say, the reward. Okay. Say that one more time because I just want to ab absorb that. Please. I'm saying that the goodness a person does mm -hmm. is the reward for having asked for goodness. That's God doing it through you. Because God is the source of good. That source that had the good baby do right. good things before it knew. That's a source. So then the good you do all your life comes from that same source. We'll begin to believe that we're the ones making it happen. But you. we're not. I got you. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I got you. So that's why asking, the word pray actually means ask. Okay. The definition okay. of the word is to ask for something. That's why they said pray tell in Old English. So the word pray is derived from the word ask. The word obey is derived from the word hear or listen, to listen. To obey God is to listen to him, mm -hmm. to hear him. It's not to, you know, flagellate yourself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sure, people sure. make it out to be what it isn't. And so then people turn on it. They go, oh, why should I believe in this big thing that wants to cast everybody into hell? But that's just a lie. It's not true. So if you don't approach it with an open mind from the beginning and say, okay, I've said there's a spirit, so let's find out. I said, I said I want goodness. Why do I want that? Where does that come from? What's the source? And here, think about this. When people quarrel, Let's say you're quarreling with a friend, hmm. right? Yep. That's different than if you're fighting. Okay, if you're fighting, eh, two people are fighting, they're beating each other, and one might kill the other, right? Yep. But let's say you're quarreling. What is quarreling? Quarreling seems to be when two people are arguing over a point that they expect, they're appealing to a higher purpose that they expect the other person should know about. Yeah, it's like you know, trying to convince. Hey, I was it's like here. Yeah, I was here first. It's not right to do that. They expect the other person to know about that higher purpose. And then the other person says back to them, no, no, it was me because you should know this, right? It's always right, about right. they expect the other guy knows about the higher purpose that they're referring to, but they don't really know what that purpose is. They know it's some kind of standard. They're, they're comparing the person's actions or words to a standard that they expect the other person should know about, and they see that he doesn't, and it turns into a quarrel. So what is that standard? How come we suspect inherently that there's a standard that no one has told us about that's always better? How do we know that the word better is better? How do we know the direction good is compared to bad? We all know that. Mm -hmm. We say, oh, that's good. And then we go, oh, that's even better. So how do we know there's a direction towards good? We're suspecting there is because inherently our spirit, which you mentioned before, that's sort of saying, our, call it our conscience. 
that's sort of saying, oh, gee, if there's good, there must be better. Well, you would, if there wasn't actually goodness, you wouldn't know when something was better than another because you'd have no standard to compare to. So push that standard to the nth degree, to a degree that you can't even understand. And that's what we're always trying to get to. The word religion is derived from the Latin term religare, which means to retie, to rebind. So we specifically feel we need to get connected to something we might have been connected to at some time before. So we're trying to get back there. That's all it means. So a guy who says, I really want to understand about spiritual things. Why? The question really becomes, well, why do you? It's because something inside of you knows it's real and you want to find it. And so you go seeking. Right. Now, along the lines, you're going to meet a lot of people. But the one advice you seem to come up against a lot, not against, but for a lot, was uh, ask, pray, be humble. You seem to be hearing this a lot. Yes. Why? Okay, so think about this. In the story of St. Paul, when he's converted on the road to Damascus, he's this like enemy of Christians. He's killing them. He's murdering them. Okay. And then all of a sudden he sees Jesus and Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It hurts to kick against the goads. What does that mean? He's, the goads were spikes, wooden spikes, that the farmer would till the ground with his oxen and he'd push, he'd push the, uh, the stick into the animal to make it go left or make it go right, to try to drive it, to do the work. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the animal would kick back against it and say, I don't want that. And he'd kick and it only hurt himself because he'd kick into the spike mm -hmm. and it would hurt him. And he's telling him, if you keep kicking back against where you're guiding, where you're being guided, all you're doing is hurting yourself. And guess what? The ground's not getting tilled either. Not doing yourself any good to fight back like that. Relax, calm down. He also said, not on in that instance, but there's also a scripture that says, I am made perfect in your weakness. People don't understand that. But think about this. If good is truly done through a person by a source, is, doesn't more good able to happen the weaker that source is so that it can completely occupy that person and not just 50%? If a person kicks back 50%, the goodness can't come out as much. If a person is weaker and weaker and weaker and more humble, the goodness can come out even more. It's like turning on a tap, 50% are full. I, I, so that is what is meant by that. And that's how I live my life. When I talk about theology, I'm not talking about knowledge. Because listen, if it took knowledge to, for salvation, every baby would be doomed because they can't read. Right. I don't believe in knowledge. That's Gnosis. That's the Gnostics that taught that. So this is what I mean about it having helped me you know, helped me greatly by understanding that I had to basically humble yourself. Yeah. Ongoing. And, and people mistake that, Greg. They, they think humbling yourself means you've got to go, oh, I'm so terrible and I'm a worm and I'm this. No, that's not what it means. That, and that's what they use to attack us when we say that. They say they think we're telling them that you have to be some kind of slathering, slobbering person crawling on the ground and saying that you're no good. God didn't create no good. He created good. So it's a lie that humility is somehow being some kind of, you know, loser. That's not true. Humility is just, it's just the ability to say, I'm not the highest thing around. I don't know everything. I'm ready to learn when I have to. And if I can't find God to talk to him directly, because, you know, I'm not one of those people that thinks God speaks to you from the ceiling. Okay. <laughs> uh, if, I can't, if I can't do that, um, then you know what? I'll do it with people. I got 8 billion practice dummies in the world to work with. <laughs> oh, man. That's uh, the way I see it. Wow. That was intense, man. Uh, thank you. That was... Um... Thanks. Man. I didn't mean to turn this into a theological discussion, but what I'm telling you is actually theology. No, I appreciate it. And I prompted you, <laughs> so you didn't turn it into anything. I was just curious because I'm going down this path now. And um, the message that various parts of the message that you just discussed 
are very similar to things I am hearing uh, often. You know, it's very consistent in, in what I'm hearing. So um, I'm just trying to figure well, out where no I doubt stand if you were, all this. Yeah, no doubt sense. if you were in a mathematics class, and you took five classes in it, you'd be hearing some consistent things from class to class. <laughs> right. Well, that's, objectively Frank, that's exactly, that's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. You know, but for me personally, this is all brand spank at 55. This is brand yeah. spanking new. So this is just, it's, it's like, man, it's just no different. I, I've only, bless you. I've only been playing guitar four years. It's no different than that. I pick up this instrument like, oh, how the hell does this work? It's literally the same learning process of, okay, you know, but, but actually tougher learning this stuff um, because, because of all the things like you talked about, like, you know, well, if you want to have a relationship with God, you've got to, you know, really uh, slather as you, you know, because there's a lot of that yeah. out there too, you know, and I never bought onto any. And in fact, that pushed me away, quite frankly. Because of course. Like, and that's why I'm, I'm what you call an Orthodox Christian. Okay. So I follow Orthodox Christianity, which is Eastern and it's ancient. Right. So, so, and it's from Antioch, okay, from the original Antiochian people with my mother, okay? So, when you, when you look at it that way, it's more of an actual practical apostolic idea mm -hmm. that doesn't really subscribe to what the rules are or what the revenge is or what all this other stuff that we're, you know, some people are mistakenly taught. It's, it's very misunderstood, that this is actually, I mean, let's say people that don't even like the whole Jesus thing were to meet this guy, Jesus, like at a cafe, okay, like <laughs> as he was, right? right. They probably love, like the guy. I love your Yeah, they practical. probably like the guy a lot, man. And they probably say, hey, I like this guy. I love you bring him home and say, hey, I met this new friend. Yeah. You're great with this, man. I, I once wrote, I wrote a paper, because I write a lot of theological papers, but I, ha I once wrote one was called why do they hate him so much and at the top of the page i i basically divided this long piece of foolscap paper you know these long legal pages uh -huh. i divided it vertically and i had two columns and in the left column <laughs> i wrote down all these things that jesus advised and taught and you know and did now that's not actually the point of christianity the point of christianity is actually resurrection but forget that for a minute i wrote down all the teachings okay so there's the teachings and then on the right side of the column, I wrote down all the ways that people raise their kids. And it was remarkably the same. Uh, you know, right, don't fight right. with your brother, sure. shake his hand, you know, all this kind of, hey, hey, don't say that, be nice. Okay, all the way they, they raise their kids. And I'm talking about non-believers, okay? sure. non-believers who raise their kids. And, the, and the, the columns were identical. I mean, it was very, and so I said, so why do they hate him so much? Right, <laughs> What's right. going on here? Right. Who's making them think they hate him? And what was your conclusion? But they don't. <laughs> what was your conclusion on that? Well, qui bono. It's Italian expression for who who benefits. So if ever I say, if ever I see uh, something going on, I want to know, well, who benefits? Right? That's typical expression, qui bono. Now, I think if I believe in a God and I believe in a good, I can't neg negate that there's also the opposite of that, because that's what the religion tells me anyway, whether I can prove it or not. So that's who benefits. Okay, so you look at who has the agenda and what the agenda is. E exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay, I get you. I'll give you an example. The Bible says at one point there's a proverb that says, perfect love casts out fear. What does that mean? Perfect love casts out fear. It, it occurred to me long time ago that well, I was thinking that the opposite of love was hate. But then it occurred to me that the opposite of love was fear. And that's why love casts it out. Now, why do I say this? I say this because it also occurred to me that this omnipotent God that I'm trying to understand, that no one can, by the way, um, can't do everything. They say, well, of course, you know, God could do anything. Well, he can't be afraid. 
God can't be afraid. Right. God can't envy. Right. Gee, I wish I could have that. <laughs> the idea of a God <laughs> envying is not possible. Okay. Oh, so this is just shit. logical impossibilities. Okay. Oh my. So God. and then on the and the same people that say you know there's a God he could do everything but okay I agree he can't be afraid and okay I agree he can't envy but he's still everything right. Well, then, if he's everything, how come those things exist? So that means that they they do exist because we feel fear, we feel envy, sure. we, feel, oh, we feel those things, okay? They're real. We feel them. Or are they? They're illusions. From the God point of view, they're not real. They're illusions. Now you say, well, if they're illusions, how come I feel them? Well, how come when you go in your room and you look in the mirror, you see yourself in there and you think it's real? But it's an illusion. You know it's an illusion, but it even moves like you. But it's an illusion. So illusions don't have to be smoky. Wait a minute. It can be very realistic. Say that again. When you look in the mirror, it's an illusion? Well, when you look in the mirror and you see Craig yeah. in the mirror, uh -huh. that's an illusion of Craig. That's not Craig. Right. It's a reflection. Right. Magicians use that all the time. They create themselves in mirrors to, so you think they're there so they can disappear. Okay? Mm -hmm. So illusions, my point is that an illusion doesn't always have to be what we think the word illusion means. It's some smoky, weird thing that you have to be stupid to, 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 to see. It can actually be something we think is real. So fear, we think fear is real. So we feel it. But actually, it isn't. Because if it was real, and if God is reality, he would have fear too. Right, okay. So, so whatever yeah. God are this omnipotent, we make into this omnipotent God can't do is obviously not real. If okay. we want to ascribe reality to that, to that being. So logically speaking, we live on our side of the fence. We live in a mixture of reality and unreality, right, like I did with the LSD. Right, because fear isn't real. It's something you create and conjure in your head. It's not something that you can touch, feel, taste. Yeah. It's, it's and envy is right. not real. Right, correct. All of the things, but did you ever notice something? All of the things that we are told, don't do this, don't do that, right? They're all the things God can't to do. Don't covet, don't envy. Do all those things... Is, it's basically advice. It's basically, hey, if you do that, you're chasing a, a chimera. You're chasing something unreal. You're giving credence to something that's not doing you any good yeah. or anybody else. Right, right. So okay. who benefits? Who benefits? Nobody on that one. The adversary benefits. The other guy or force, that's the benefit. So if you cast out, if a person says, I, you know, I don't want this God thing in my life. Guess what God does? He goes, okay. God doesn't compel. He persuades. So if you say go away, God is like the proverbial boyfriend who will go away if the girl says, I don't want to know you. <laughs> okay. It's like, okay, I'll go away. Okay. He goes away until you say, come back. And then he comes back. So let's say a person casts, casts it off. I don't want this anymore. It interferes with my business life or it interferes with my love life or it interferes with whatever life I want to have. Yeah. It puts guilt on my head or whatever they think. They cast it off. Guess what? It's like, okay, but now what happens? Now you're void of that immune system. It's like a, it's like a patient casting off his immune system, begins to get all kinds of sicknesses, but doesn't mean the sicknesses said, hey, look, there's a guy over there. Let's go attack him. That those sicknesses are attacking you right now. Cancers, all kinds of things, but your immune system is dutifully keeping them away. You don't know that. It's working all day, 24-7. Sure. Now, if you throw it away, all of a sudden, opportunistically, all the sicknesses take root. So a person who casts off the idea of spiritual goodness, let's say God, okay, they're throwing away the only thing that makes them immune to becoming evil. And so the only thing left is all the sicknesses take root. So the sins that a person does, it's not like people are teaching, you do the sin and God leaves you. No, 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 no. It's you leave God and then the sins are there. The cart goes before the horse. The person who's sinning 
is sinning as a result of having gotten away from that immune system. Okay. He doesn't do it first and have it done to him in reverse, like some kind of revenge. Right. I, I understand what you're saying. You see where I'm going with that? Yeah. So when you look at it that way, you think you wanted to look at it as a spirit. That's fine. You know, you want to call it spirituality. That's fine. But let's look at how it implies and impacts your actual life in a practical sense. Because let's say we live practically. We could sit around and philosophize all day doesn't do anything for us because we've got to get up tomorrow and live practically. We've got to get on the bus and meet people and pay our bills and say hello and wave and drive our cars. Th this is our life. This is our reality. So how do we take that idea and say, it's not so all fired important that we have to be on our knees flagellating ourselves. And we just have to get up every day, interact with human beings that God created just like he created us. You know, the most poignant statement I've ever read was at one time when I was angry at my brother in, in my actual brother, not a human, my brother type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I read this thing that said in the Bible that said, you are des you are denigrating your brother. You are denigrating your mother's son. And that came home to root with me. Wow, I'm attacking my own mother's son. It just made sense to me. So if we if we extrapolate that to a world in a worldly sort of sense, kind of everybody else is like when you do it to them, you're kind of doing it to your father's son or your mother's son. It's the same thing, but you, we don't look at it that way. We look at it as that guy did this to me, and therefore he doesn't deserve me to like him. And no one's telling us that we have to be fond of people who act like jerks. That's not what love your neighbor means. Love is an action, not a feeling. It's a verb. So love your neighbor just means do for people and cut them the same slack you'd cut yourself when you screw up. Because when you screw up, you don't look in the mirror and say, boy, do I hate myself. I'm not going to talk to me anymore. You're a self. It just means cutting people the same slack. That is the message. If you want to look at Christianity as a message thing, that's the message. Mercy. Mercy is the heart of the law. Now, it's more than that because it deals with other things, you know, resurrection, stuff like that, afterworlds, afterlives. But I'm saying if you only want to deal with the message, the message is simply mercy. That's the real truth about it. And if you look at all the good things you're told to do and all the bad things you're told not to do, it always comes down to being merciful. And wow. you can choose. It's not a rule. It's not a rule. You can choose. You can say, no, I'm not going to be merciful. I wish that people who do the bad stuff, I wish they would just own it. I'm doing it. I know it's wrong, but I don't care. I like it. And they know, I know a lot of junkies that say that. Okay. <laughs> but most people, most people feel so bad about what they're doing that they have to make it right. No, no, I'm doing it because it's right. And they want to find all these reasons to kind of justify what's wrong. Yeah. That's the wrong way to go about it, in my opinion. Now, they can do that if they like. I just think you're fooling yourself. You do the, if you do the crap, own it. Say, yeah, yeah, I know it's bad, but I own it. Own it. Because if you keep on owning it, You'll get so sick of it, you won't want to do it anymore. You will. Wow. Just like junkies. Sooner or later, they say, I can't be a junkie anymore. Just like alcoholics. Sooner or later, they say, I can't be in a... They justified their drinking for so long, and then sooner or later, they go, I can't do this. It's, sure. I was fooling myself. They begin to say, I need to be healthy. Um. This... Sorry, it went to this direction, Craig. I thought you were going to talk about the cars. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, you're not going to shut me up when it comes to this subject. I'll tell uh, no, you that. I know this. Well, I know that. Let's uh, let's shift gear. First of all, no. In all seriousness, in all seriousness, thank you. I appreciate that. Was really heartfelt and genuine. And thanks. I, that was really kind of you to to uh, share all that. Um, that being said, let's shift gears. And I'm not uh, in any way minimizing or like 
I know. I yeah, get it. Don't discounting worry. Discounting anything you said. I, I just want to remotely get back on topic, <laughs> even though I'm the one who probably got us out of topic. So I'll own yeah. it. I had, I got no problem owning anything I do. Um, Max Zoom, speaking of which you mentioned, comes out. You're 18, and I, and I read somewhere you started working on it when you were like 16 or something like that? I did. I recorded half the record or parts of the record when I was still 16, finished it when I was 17, and it was done by the time I was 17. I wasn't 18 yet, and um, then it came out. What was that? What did you learn from that experience? Because that had to be pretty like eye-opening. Well, what I did, I can't say I learned something then at the time, like I wasn't mm-hmm. thinking about learning anything, but now you say, what, what do I, my, what can I take from that experience now, now that I know what I know, right? Uh, well, it was the single just, biggest, in general, the single biggest yeah. thing I know now about that, about that experience is that I never should have signed with a record company. Ah, oh, okay. It was a bad deal. No, what, but it what? was, it, it's not something that should have been done. It was a st- it, 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 yes, it started the good part of it is it started me on a career that made records and got people to know my music. The bad part of it was you're dealing with people who are not, you know, very usually, not all the time, but very usually not the best people to deal with. And they will usually treat artists, music, and work and humanity in the worst of ways. Mm. It's, it's, it didn't have to be so. I guess at the time it had to be so, so I'm not going to argue with that, but you know, and that's what I think now. Right. Like, but at the time, what did I think? Well, at the time I didn't want to sign with the record company. And so the only reason we did Maxoom was because they promised me gear. <laughs> you know, they tried for months. Let's get this kind, let's get this kid to record this kid. We can make money with this kid. Let's promise him anything. And I kept saying, no, no, no. I'm anti-establishment. I don't want to do it. I was a hippie. Right. So, uh-huh. and I'm, I'm recovering from LSD. So they were like the enemy, you know, and no, no, no. And then it was like, I tell you what, we'll put you in this place. We'll give you a key. We won't come come there at all. We'll let you do it yourself. We'll let you produce it yourself, and we'll give you all this gear to play with. I said gear. <laughs> well, we didn't call it gear, but it was equipment, right? There's all this equipment in there. Equipment? Oh, <laughs> really? Squirrel? You know, like the yeah. dog. And so yeah, so we go in there. They never came there once. <laughs> we just did whatever we wanted. They let me be the producer, right? Right. And they, as long as I signed, they gave me whatever that, you know, esoteric stuff was. Mm -hmm. And I did sign. It was like, okay. As a matter of fact, my parents had to sign. Yeah. That's too young. Yeah. And and, uh, I still have that contract, my parents' signature on it. That's funny, man. And and so that's what started it. What, What ended up coming out of it that was really good was this. When those people in their greed wanted to make more money instead of just letting me go as an artist, they literally sold my contract to another record company Hmm. for money. So I simply became the property of the next record company. Right. Right. And when the next record company wanted to do that again, they sold my contract again to another record company. In that case was Columbia. So what happened was, the conditions that were in the first one that let me produce and leave me alone type of thing artistically right. transferred from one company to the next. So by the time I got to the majors, if you want to put it this way, 20th yeah. century in, in Colombia, they couldn't change that. But there's no way in hell they would have let a 16-year-old kid produce his own record in 1970. Right, right. Wow. But they had to because that was part of the original deal. So what ended up happening that became good about it is I got a career in production and I produced every album I ever did. And I learned how to do that stuff. I learned how to be a genuine engineer and a genuine producer from a very early age. No other artist had that allowed to him ever. Maybe today they might, but back then it was impossible. They wouldn't take some kid and let him produce records that they were spending half a million dollars on. Yeah, not not at all. But in my case, they had to. Because they bought the contract. And so that was the good that came out of it. I got to do my music, my way, without having to compromise it. 
I could say what I wanted, play what I wanted. They were always trying to talk me out of it. That's for sure. Every day, every record. What do they but want I would you to say, do different? No, no, I'm doing what I want. What do they want you to do different? Shorter songs, pop uh, okay. tunes, yeah. harmony vocals, no guitar solos, uh, get on the radio, dress a certain way, do sex, sexy shit. Uh, you know, include more females in terms of the advertisements and, you know, the whole cars and females thing. Sure, sure. Drugs and sex and all that, you know. I wasn't, in, no, it was for me, it was like, no, what are you, nuts? Like, I'm not into that stuff. I'm into what I'm doing. That's it. I'm doing it my, you know, I'm like Frank Sinatra. I'm doing it my way. No, I hear you. Know? you. I, I hear you. I like that. About so that's you. the good. That's the good that came out of it. The good that came, but what was the bad that came out of me doing it my way was that I did, it did not translate into multi-million sales and, you know, your picture all over the newspapers and everything like, like other people. But I was okay with that. I, you know, I was hardly ever on the radio and when they would play my songs, they'd play my cover tunes. I only ever covered nine tunes in my whole career and yet that's all they'd play yeah that is weird you know they'd play my hendrix cover or they'd play you know my dylan cover you know like or my doors cover yeah i covered four or five tunes that was it but that's what radio would play because it was safe yeah. oh well we got to play this merino guy let's play something safe <laughs> right everybody right. knows purple haze let's play that you know so that was the bad that came out of that me doing it my way but had i played the game had i said oh yeah okay guys yeah what do you want me to wear where should i stand you know yeah okay let's do this this way and that way maybe they would have played ball a little more and said don't worry we're going to make you a star but i didn't want to be a star i was embarrassed by it i didn't like it yeah, but you wouldn't have made like music you, you couldn't have made music that that i mean sincerely Made music. Sincerely, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but here's the thing. I never, I don't like applause. Really? Literally. Yeah, I don't like it. Why? Still? It's embarrassing. Yes. It's embarrassing, Wh man. Why? Well, think about it. You walk into a room and everyone stands up and claps for you. Why? I mean, I think I've it's just. This, a, I've said this before. On the one hand, they're telling me I'm talented, right? Right. Right. So why would you clap for a talented person? That's not the person. That's the gift of the person. So it's like kind of like clapping for a handsome person or a good-looking girl. It's a gift. They're good-looking. Right. You clap for that. The clapping, <laughs> the, you know, Depends. the clapping should be, well, the, look, it's like someone gave you a Ferrari. They're going to clap for you. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's a gift. You have a gift. Right, right. That's well, your I, gift. Other people have gifts. Look at there's very gifted people, but they're not in the arts. So right. there's gifted mathematicians, there's gifted artists, there's gifted all there's gifted people that are really gifted at carrying boxes from one warehouse to another. Yeah, okay? but I think like it's just gifts an everywhere. We don't clap for enough gifted people. I think it's just an acknowledgement of that you're making them happy. I mean, like when I clap for someone, if I'm in the audience, it's because they made me feel good. And I understand. Um, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not denigrating their motives. I'm yeah. not saying that they have bad motives. They have great motives, and I appreciate that they do it. it just I, doesn't just feel embarrassing good. for me. Yeah. yeah, it's like you know when when bands would get in and out of limousines. <laughs> yeah, not personally, right? but I would I've see bands get in and out of limousines, and I would think, what a jerk. Like, what are you doing? Why are you in a limousine? Why are you Why are you hiding from the crowd? You know they'd have their they have their their um, security guys all around them. And, no, don't look at him. You know he's going in the building now. You know it's like really weird. Yeah, but, but I think that's hadn't why. Sold a bunch of records. If he hadn't sold a bunch of records, they wouldn't be saying he's going in the building now. Yeah, but I think Quick, what don't you look said, away. <laughs> I think it's what you said. It, it's they have some guy telling them. So if you have a whole no, 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 if no. you have a whole squadron of people saying, "Hey, you got to go in this limousine and do here," not many yeah, people Craig. are going to say, "No, nah, man, you know, I'm just going to um, get in my friend's." No, Jeep. Craig, I'll tell you the truth of the matter. Okay, I, I I heard that way too much in the business for too many years. Okay, mm -hmm. oh yeah, my manager won't let me do it, or the record company told me I need to do this or that. Well, that's not true. First of all, it's a lie, and I'll tell you why. Sicilians have an expression: the the fish stinks from the head down. <laughs> it sounds like no, I'm sound like I'm listening to an episode yeah. of The Godfather Part One. <laughs> yeah, but but well, my father was Sicilian, so he'd say things like that, you know. But but look, 
nobody in any band, unless they're unless they're like the back member. Okay, I agree with that. Like some guy they've got that plays rhythm or whatever is behind the curtain. Fine, I agree with that. They're told what to do. They do what they're told. But the star? What are you kidding me? You think the manager tells the star what to do? It's the star that tells the manager what he wants to do, and the manager tells the world, "I'm telling the star what to do," so he takes the heat. Let's be honest here. There's, there's never been a single star that was told by his manager, you need to do this. And he'd go, okay, sir. No, but it's the it... other way around. Yeah, they but... hire the manager. The manager doesn't hire them. Okay, right. So they, so the, <laughs> the artist can sit anytime and say, y- you know what, Bob, I don't really want to go in a limousine. This, I, I'm doing just... this. Yeah, which is what I did. Okay, get which, I get it. I understand what you're saying. So so when you see them blaming okay. their manager for whatever, it doesn't have to be just the limousine. Many things they blame their managers for, yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah. It's really them. They're lying to you. Gotcha. gotcha. Now, here's how you know. When they were on the up escalator, you couldn't even get to meet them or whatever. Now that they're on the down escalator, they have meet and greets. <laughs> These same people that wouldn't meet you before are happy, all too happy to meet you and say, thank you very much for buying my record and coming to my concert. And by the way, give me the $600 for the ticket that you paid to meet me. Right, right, right. Okay, this is ridiculous, so charging people it, money to meet you. I, I that's get... insane. <laughs> oh, okay, that's God. insane. That's that's like the height of, of sociopaths. Oh, you know, my... like it's crazy. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. You're pretty fast. We're going to charge you $600 so you could come and stand at a rope line and then come and sit on my lap like Santa Claus and say thank you very much. And then we're going to get the next person to come from the rope line to sit on my lap. Yeah, All but- these Hollywood people that freak out because photographers follow them everywhere. You know what? Go out of your house every day. Give everybody pictures of yourself. It'll be so devalued. They won't follow you anymore. Um, yeah, but Frank, you're such a maverick. Most people are not like you. Not uh, a I'm, maverick. I'm a normal guy. No, but that, you're <laughs> a maverick. When normalcy becomes when yeah. normalcy becomes being a maverick, yes. there's something wrong. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. But you are, and I'm saying that in a good way. I'm not like uh, that's not a criticism behind it. That's you're different like that. You are like fuck it. I'm doing what I want to do. I'm marching to the beat of my own drum. That's like more of a scarcity than a commodity in general with anything. Whether it's musicians or fucking baking cakes or being a parent or whatever, you know, that's not the norm. I like that. And I'm attracted to people that are like that. And I and I think I've I've been like that. And sometimes I've been like that only because I want to be like that, not even because I'm necessarily giving credence to what I'm doing. It's just that I don't want to do what everybody else wants to do. But Well, I will say this about that. Normal. I will agree with you and say it this way. What I, the way I am is not common. But it's normal. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying it's not. Normal. Okay, so no, commonality not, is yeah, not necessarily normal. Normal, <laughs> right? Okay, right. Same yeah. thing. Normal for you, but it's not yeah. com- right. Okay, whatever wh- you know, the, whatever you want to say. But that's this part. That's just the way it is, Frank. You're just a super maverick, and you don't. You don't. You want to do your thing, and fuck it. Good for you. You know, and, and you. It should. just happens to be I'm in the I'm in the arts. I happen to be in the arts, but I do a lot of other things. I race cars. You know, I do all other things. So. It's like, <clears throat> I like to say, I'm not a hyphenated person. Nobody is a hyph- should be a hyphenated person like, you know, Frank the guitarist, Frank the drummer, Frank the <laughs> race car, you know, Frank, you know, Frank the guy that does, I'm not hyphen, I'm Frank, you know, happen to play guitar, right. happen right. to play drums too, I play keyboards, you Frank, know, I, I, I like to cook pizza. You're I'm preaching. not Frank the pizza maker. I know you're preaching to the <laughs> choir, but you, okay. But here's, I would bet this is, you went through something that was, and and I don't know if it was your acid trip or something, something happened to you that was very difficult. You got through it. And it gave you a different vantage point on what is important in life that True. other people don't have. I mean, I'm willing to bet that, right? True. I'll modify your last part of your statement that other people don't know they have. Um, or that maybe they haven't gone through. Right. But they don't know it, but they've got it. I'm saying to you oh, this, yeah. and I mean this in all sincerity, yeah. it's not false humility. Anybody 
I mean, I'm not saying a guy that has no arms or legs, okay? But anybody can do what anybody else can do. I agree, 100%. There's no fucking thing is can't. I agree with you, 100%. But what I'm saying is there's some, you went through something that at a young age probably that gave you a sense of what the fuck is really important. And, and it's not limousine ride to you. It's not limousine rides. It's not some other bullshit. It's, and, and you also got a sense of man here today, gone tomorrow, but for the grace of God. And you know what? I don't need these other trappings because I want to enjoy the here today and try to make the most of it. Sure. But other people. At the end of the day, that's all you've got, right? A hundred percent. But at the, but a lot, but. Most people, but a lot of people haven't gone through that stuff or they went through it and they didn't have that as a conclusion. Okay. That's fair. Right. So that's why, and and I'm like that. And that's why I get you, (laughs) which is scary, Frank, as I'm listening to you saying, I get you, but, uh, that, you know, I mean that in a positive way, of course. Um, you know, but uh, that's, I think a lot of people haven't gotten to that conclusion either they don't have the internal strength or or coping skills or you know they're not they're not as in touch with the things that maybe they should be i don't know it's not really my well they, i i believe that it it would be really nice if people who understand that like you or me or men there are many more we're not that yeah, unique no if they would somehow get their other people and their other friends to understand that too. That's how I raised my kids. I have three daughters that turned out like me in the sense that they don't think they're limited and they think they can do whatever they are able to put their mind to. Sure. Uh, they really do think that it's not like they wake up every day going, wow, I'm so great. I can do anything I put my mind to. It's just common. It just sort of impermeates who you are. Right. I mean, really think about, the miracle we perform when we just, you know, get up at, in the beginning of the day and go up and cook food. Yeah. You know, like it's, you don't think that it's such a, an amazing thing to do it because it's second nature or you go and you play a guitar or you do this or you mow the lawn or you're good at gardening. You know, these are the things everybody is just, is okay. But what happens is people around us try to make us think we're not. We either need their help or we need to buy the latest, greatest thing or, you know, there's always some kind of agenda going on somewhere. Hmm. And that's what makes a lot of people not reach that potential you're talking about because they think, well, I can't really do that. Well, why not? If you really want to, you can. Now, I'll agree there's a difference between someone saying, I would like to do that and I want to do that. Many people would like to do things sure. that they can't do because they would only like to do them. <laughs> but when a person wants to do them, okay. Oh, yeah. That's hilarious. It's so true, but it's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but when the person, that same person decides that it's no I'm, longer, I would like to, but I want to, all of a sudden he finds a way. Right. I would like to, I'm not going to fucking do it, but I'd like to, I'd like to, if I didn't have to do it, but I'd like to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get what I'm saying? So, no, I totally get and, and so what did I want to do? I wanted to play a guitar for various reasons, not because I wanted to be good at it, because I wanted to save my life. Right. So I wanted to play the guitar. I did. Okay. So I want to do songs. I did. Right. Now there's a lot of things I would have, I, I wanted to race cars. I did. So I needed to know how to build engines and cars. So I wanted to do that. So I learned all about it. I wanted to build my own amplifiers, my own pedals, my own sounds. So now I need to, well, in order to do that, you need to know electronics. So then I went and learned electronics. There's books, you read them, you learn, you try and you go, okay, now I know. Well, so now, you have to do the first steps to anything, yeah. right? And if you want to so do something, easy. it's not going to come by magic. But now you it's want to so do it. easy because you, you, everything's online. My God, the, the world yeah. is literally so, at your fingertips. Yeah. Right. Anybody wants to do it, they have the ability, they have the libraries. You know, Einstein once said, the only thing he has to ever remember is where the library is. <laughs> right, right. Right. So that's, he's basically saying what I'm saying. If you really want to do something, the information is available, you go, and then you might find out when you find the information, okay, the information is telling you it requires that you do this, 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 and this first before you do the thing you want to do. Well, if you really want to, you'll go through the preliminaries, which is what I did. 
I didn't say, I want to build amplifiers and pedals, and poof, I read one article and built a pedal. Yeah, yeah, of course. I had to learn, what are atoms? How do they work? What is electricity? How does it work? Why does it do this? And you, know, and you go through all the stuff, and eventually you're building better and better pedals and better and better amplifiers. The result, people listen to my amplifier on the DVD, for instance, and they go, wow, your tone is amazing. How did you do it? Which amp did you buy? So I didn't buy it. I made it. Well, hold on a minute. Let's. This, I want to shift gears again. <laughs> to, 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 yeah. Thank God you're talking about amplifiers. I want to talk about a couple of your songs that I really love, and I just have some questions on them. Um, you have a song, Ain't Dead Yet, in the power of rock and roll. Dude, mm-hmm. that, that is some of the, the most amazing guitar playing i've ever heard and i was was was, did you know was something going on that day like was there you know something in your water or did you know when you walked out of there that holy shit i just crushed this thing because that is really amazing no 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 it's just no it's just that that particular way of playing that particular we called it a solo or an outro or whatever you're talking about yeah fits that song so had the song been three chords different there would have been a different approach. So it was just another day in the office that happened to work. Yeah. yeah that's well, it, it has to work. So juggernaut, for instance, is another one similar to that. Okay. It's got the same sort of feel, but in a darker way. Mm-hmm. And so it's got a more appropriate version of how you would play guitar to that. But if I do a blues, like my version of red house, for instance, mm-hmm. it's a 16 bar blues. It's not even the original right? Just happens to use those lyrics. So it's a totally different approach. And some people say, well, who the heck is this Frank guy? Like, is he a jazz player? Is he a blues player? Is he ain't dead yet guy? Is he, which guy is he? How come he's so different from song to song? Like, and that was the problem the record companies had. They said, we don't know how to sell your stuff yeah, because we don't know what you are yeah. on every single album. You got four styles or five. Right, right. He says, when we sell ACDC, we know what we're selling. When we sell Frank Sinatra, we know what we're selling. We don't have a Frank Sinatra record where all of a sudden he's doing a metal tune. Right. I get it. I know. Their their points were valid. I'm not saying they're idiots. They're right. From a purely selling point of view, it's ridiculous to have five styles. But that's just me. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe if I cared more about selling, then I would have said, okay, you're right. Yeah, I'll do only rock. Right. Yeah, but but why it. should I limit myself if I don't care? No, you shouldn't. Like you if, should. I, if I just want to do the art, I want to do this picture. I want to do Ain't Dead Yet. There's a message in Ain't Dead Yet. It's actually a message to those people. Because they were all telling me, ah, it's over. You're finished. This and that. No one will ever come and see you again. There you go. Uh-huh. Right? So it's like, oh, you think so? I'm still here. Another, another I'm still here. It's 50 years later. I'm still here. And I guess I wasn't kidding because I still do the same music. I still look the same. You do I'm look the, the same, same guy. Man. You, you, you do look the same. That's pretty amazing. What the hell are you doing? I'm, I'm still here. What's your anti-aging? Re- that's, that's what we should be talking about here, Frank. What is your anti-aging regime? Because <laughs> you look really good, well, man. In the last, in the last t- five to 10 years, it caught up with me. I lost some, you know, I lost some hair, but it's thinned out. Yeah. But, the, but the point is, the, it's just getting up, you know, I don't know. It's like every day is the same for me. It's, I don't think of Frank Marino in the seventies as like a long time ago. I think of it as like, Oh yeah, I did that last week. Yeah. You know what? That's interesting. That's really interesting because, um, I mean, you only ever live one day. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Right. That's the only day you ever know is today. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then tomorrow comes and Oh, it's today again. (laughs) You know, it's like, yeah. it's, you don't live tomorrow and you don't live in the past. Right. What's the difference? If I get up at, if I get up to the, today and I had a dream, oh my God, I had this dream and this happened and that happened and thank God it was a dream, right? That happens a lot to people. Oh, sure. thank God it was a dream. Well, so was yesterday's actual events. You get up, you could easily say, oh, thank God it was a dream. Right. Guy <laughs> beat me up yesterday. Oh, thank God it was a dream. Yeah, right. It's yeah, got yeah. the same value sure. as a dream because it's a memory at this point. Right. Correct. So I sort of like look at things that way. Thank you know, here I am today again. Today right. is the same. You know, Groundhog Day, that movie. Yep. 
Yep. I, that's how my life is. I get you. That's it. Truly. No, I get you. I totally get you. I, I I'm, but everyone's life is like that. It's not unique. They just right. don't notice it. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of people are uh, in looking in the rearview mirror or worrying about tomorrow, and and, right. and and that's a hard thing to not do. And I know myself. I worked really, really, really hard. I, I mean, I worked really hard, and then I just reached the decision I wasn't going to do, it, and it was over that quick because I was just done with it. But it's yeah. it's some. Um, I think you got to get to a point, or maybe you know, like you were at a point earlier, and you're just there. But I think you got to get to a point where you say, "I'm done with this shit. I'm just being right here, right now." Um, well, let me ask you a question, Craig. Yeah. If you go, you yourself, because you obviously have a circle of friends, you know a lot of people. So if you pick out, I don't know, four or five people from your circle of friends or people that you know or family members, and you ask them to quantify the percentage of good and bad in their life, what do you think the numbers will come back at in terms of percent? Oh. Uh, what, do you think they'll, what do you think they'll tell you? Well, I, I no, most of them would pretty high percentage of good and pretty low percentage of bad. Right. And what do you think the numbers will be? Uh, man, quantify like- it. Uh, probably 90, 10, 90, right. 10, 90 good, 10 bad. But there are people who say, ah, 50, 50, Mets and Mets, you know, half, half, you have yeah. good days and bad days. They almost talk in as if it's a 50, 50 thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I'm, truth of the matter is, truth of the bad, matter is, but it's just how you look if at you it. have a normal, <laughs> yeah, truth of the matter is if you have a normal life like everybody else, I'm not saying if you're, you know, Stephen Hawking in a wheelchair. Okay. Yeah. But if you have a normal life like everybody else or most people that you know, you can quantify it by simply looking at one day and then extrapolating it by multiplying it by 365 and however many years you live. So how many bad things happened to you today? And how long did they take out of your 16 hours awake? Today? So whatever that percentage is, that's what it is in your life. So if one thing happened to you today and it took two minutes that you didn't like, out of the hours you were awake, whatever percentage that is, that's the percentage of bad in your life. I think good multiply it. In- some days there'll be ten minutes of crap, but some days there'll be none. Okay, right. there'll be days with nothing wrong. Okay, and most days nothing bad happens. Most days. Yeah. So if you quantify it that way, it's going to come out to something like point zero 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 one percent. Right. And extrapolate that. That means your whole life is about that. Right. But most people see more of the bad. They notice the bad. They don't notice the good. So now we understand why uh, the Bible teaches that the, the key to contentment and happiness is gratitude. Yeah, yeah. If a person is grateful, it's because they're looking at the, the good. You can't be grateful unless you're noticing good things. Right. So if you're looking at good, you're going to be happy. Yeah, I would agree with Corollary that. Corollary to that, if you're looking at bad, you're not going to be happy. Yeah, yeah. Right. If right. you want to buy a Volkswagen, all of a sudden you see millions around the street when you drive. Yeah, man. It's not like they suddenly <laughs> jumped out there, okay? <laughs> You're interested in a new Volkswagen, and yeah. you, start, you suddenly start seeing Volkswagens everywhere, right? Yeah. But it's not like they said, hey, Craig's interested in Volkswagens. Let's appear. Yeah, right. <laughs> they were there. You just didn't notice them, right? <laughs> Oh my, Frank! You have an your voice is so cool. The way you, uh, you're just your uh, the tone of your voice. I'm like an auditory, as as probably most people are that are into music. Your voice is awesome, man. You could do anything. You could do voiceovers, anything. I, I know that's totally irrelevant, but I just your voice is great in the conversation. Um, you can hear me narrate hockey games. <laughs> <laughs> um, another. I have another question about another song. The answer on uh, Mahogany Rush Four. I, yeah. There's some really trippy <laughs> lyrics in there, to say the least. I, I always thought that was like, kind of like an acid trip. But is there something? It like, is. Be, okay. Okay. A, that's okay. it. Remember, I told you I was looking for a way out. Yeah. So yeah, by okay. Mahogany Rush Four, right? That's many years after my my acid trip. I'm right. still was still looking. Look at the words I'm writing. Yeah, it was. It's pretty trippy. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm standing in a silver room, and you know, sound sound inside my head like a sonic boom. A preacher with a dagger, purple and black, is drawing sacred pictures in right. my naked back. Right. These are actual experiences. In your in your trip. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's why these aren't like I'm making them up because they sound cool. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. I'm, I'm, that's what I thought. It was like had to be like this some you know drug trip that you were on, or you know something. Well, like that. and don't forget, I hadn't done any drugs since since I began playing guitar. So all of this was during my life as a not drug user. 
Wow. It's the remnants of that that started me off in music. It didn't go away a week later or a year later, even 10 years later. Dude, that's probably it, one of the things why you're, you have gratitude. Because you came no back. No kidding. Because you came because <laughs> you came back. Because you could have easily like not have come back having all this shit so intense for that many years afterwards. I bet you that gives you a hell of a lot of fucking gratitude. Of man. course. I my you know, I my daughters used to think I was nuts, like when they were smaller, because I'd say, Come <laughs> here, come here, I want to show you something. And they'd they'd come out, you know, to the backyard and I'd say, Look at those trees, the way they, they look against the blue sky. And they go, <laughs> Yeah, so Oh. Yeah, so yeah, it's like, Dad, what's wrong with you? Right, I'd go, but look at them. You haven't yeah. actually looked at the two <laughs> colors together. Like, look at them, and then sooner or later they'll go. You know what? That's true. Yeah. Kind of shiny. You know, it's kind of. There's a lot of good stuff going on, man. That's uh... a lot of good stuff going on. You don't have to be in music or even have money or whatever. I grew up. We didn't grow up with money. We live in you know very poor circumstances. I mean, but nobody was like upset about it. It was like, okay, hey, look, mom made this tonight. Yeah. And there's extra. <laughs> you know? let, me was, ask, let me ask you this. Is there, if there was any, if you could go back, which I know is contrary to how you think, um, it was, is there any advice that you would have given younger Frank, assuming you would have listened, that would have made your life easier? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. First of all, yeah. I would have told him, look, even though these drugs are going to turn you into what you're going to be, let's forget that. You'll be something else. Don't do that. Yeah. And don't smoke cigarettes. You smoke now? That was that was the worst thing I ever did was become a cigarette smoker because believe me, it's very hard to get off of it. And it's not, you know, makes you, never mind what it might do to you life and death wise. That's obvious. I'm talking about the way you feel. Okay. From yeah. day to day. Yeah. So I'd say that it don't smoke cigarettes, yeah. you know, but you know what, if you want to smoke cigarettes, go ahead. I'm not like a smoke Nazi. Sure. You know, it, but, but I would say don't, you know, and I would say, don't do these drugs. You'll find, well, you know, let's say old Frank, young Frank would tell old, you know, time machine Frank, yeah, but time machine Frank, if I don't do the drugs, <laughs> I won't become you. You'll disappear. I'd say, that's good. Let me disappear. You'll find another place. Wow. Man, that's really um, candid of you. That was very cool of you. So you still smoke now cigarettes? I just quit. Good for you, man. Yeah, about four or five weeks ago. How's it going? It's all right. Not a problem. Yeah, it's even though I smoked for 50 years. <laughs> well, it's tough. I, I smoked when I was a kid. I didn't smoke for 50 years. And the only thing yeah. that saved me is I started working out right after that. And yeah. I was. I doing, mean, I stopped yeah. because I stopped because of that. I stopped because it was like, huff, huff. Yeah. Going, I, I have a, a beautiful dog, Australian Shepherd. I like to take him for a walk. I couldn't get five minutes. Sure. You know, it's like, okay, now it didn't affect me that much when I was 50, 55, you know, but now, believe me go up the stairs and it was like hey what the heck you know well, good for you man it's i hope you uncomfortable can. not like i couldn't do it but it was just uncomfortable i'm saying sure. well i don't feel very comfortable so i got to figure out how to stop doing this so i got these little candies you know the whatever nicorette candies yeah. and put them under my tongue and yeah it works fine good for it's you not, man. not as hard as not as hard i you know not as hard as people think it is Man, I hope I hope you you uh, I hope that lasts with you and you're able to do that. That'd be really great. That's, you're, yeah, so that's what I'd advise awesome. young Frank, you know. But but if if I was to say, let's say, not go that far as to erase me, because advising <laughs> young Frank about that would erase you're, me. Yes. See, I'd be talking to you now, and it would go back, <laughs> and you'd be talking to an empty phone. <laughs> so. so but I would, there are certain things that now that Frank went in that direction, you know, music, let's talk the music business. Sure. Okay. Yeah. There's things that would tell him not to do. Come on, man. They don't, don't sign this away and that away and, you know, get someone to look at the paper. Yeah. You know, like million things like that. Sure. But I was always, even in the scene, you know, when we were touring and, doing all the, the outdoor shows and all that stuff with all the other bands, the festivals, things. 
I was always kind of like the outcast guy, you know, like uh, not really part of the party, you know, looking at it from a distance. What did I, what did I have in common? I wasn't drinking. I wasn't taking any drugs. I wasn't screwing around with million girls. You know, I'm, I'm 40 years with my wife, you know? That's all. Congratulations. That's really cool. I'm that kind of guy. Just, mm -hmm. that doesn't make me better. I'm just that kind of guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, I like being that kind of guy, you sure. know? It's, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, so what was I supposed to do in that business? Well, where do I fit into the parties? Where do I fit into the the yakking and the, you know, I don't really fit in. So I was a wallflower. It's like, you know, Hey, hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Oh, can I sit there? You know, I, that's what I, I would come into rooms like that, you know, which is interesting I wasn't because, brash. because, um, <clears throat> I, I don't know you well, but you seem like you could pretty much talk to anybody now. Oh, I can. Yeah. But you know, one thing you don't want, look, you're talking to me, you're asking me questions. I'm going to always tell the truth and I'm going to tell it the way I see it. But I'm not going to walk into a room and say, hey, everybody, listen to me. Of I have something not. to say. Well, this is an interview. I'll it's, never do that. I will uh, never God, do that. I hope uh, most normal people <laughs> wouldn't. Most yeah. of the people have been no, on this show. No, there's a lot of that. musicians that do that. No, no. Are you kidding? There's a lot of musicians that do that. Oh, really? Like, here I am. Let me tell you how it is kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure, sure. There's many, many. More than there aren't. Wow. wow. More than there aren't. Um, do you ever notice when these interviews happen? with a lot of these guys, actors, musicians, it's a lot of I, 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 me, me, me. It's usually what it is. Um, yeah, but I not that it's bad necessarily. In, in, all, but in all fairness, that's like, I, my interviews aren't like that because they're more like, I want to learn something. And so I'm okay. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, like I've learned a lot here to be honest with you. And I always try to learn no matter who I'm talking to. That's like what I really enjoy at, about this um, good thing to do yeah i mean you know there's no downside to learning you know as you said yeah. the, the library is, is a, a really important address so to me my library is inside of people's heads and what they're willing to share with me mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but I, I guess i guess so I, I, but isn't that the point of of, an, of most of these like on tv kind of interviews isn't like that's the point of them it may be the point but i think that the artist could somehow interject themselves. Yeah. Like I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I know they're there to be, you know, what are you doing these days? What are you, you know, I, well, I just am working on this album or I just bought this car or whatever. I get it. They're there to interview the person. And there's a lot of vicarious listeners who want to live through that person's experience. Well, that's that's the problem. Well, that's yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> that's the problem. But what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is we always have the opportunity, for instance, to talk about ourselves, which I'm doing. I'm talking about myself too, sure. you know, Sure. but maybe we can show how it might help others do this or that. Right. Right. Or find this or that. Maybe just plant a seed. You know, I'm not sure. saying you're going to come there with the answers to their questions. I mean, who, who, nobody has all the answers, but I'm saying, Hey, you know, if we're going to talk about music. Maybe I talk about how to build an app, you know, like maybe yeah. I tell some guy, oh, you know, when I string my guitar, I do it this way because this does this. Now he learns something out of that. Yeah. Yes, I'm talking about me, but he gets something out of it. Yeah, but it's not about you like, well, I eat toast tea, you know, whatever, oat yeah. Quaker oatmeal for breakfast, yeah. you know, and, you know, and of course I look good because I do, you know, or here's my, you know, my, uh, lotion i use. yeah yeah I, I get what you're saying yeah it's yeah i know so it's just we're not, having a real conversation yeah, here yeah. and i'm learning about you well that's scary don't think i won't <laughs> go away from this not knowing a hell of a lot more <laughs> you know you mentioned guitars man another good segue uh, i want to ask you you've always played sgs and now i know the reason why because your mom got you that guitar in various mm -hmm. formats and a lot of times <clears> you're playing that one with with three single coils yeah what? And, That's and, because, look, uh, SGs with PAF, original PAF pickups, you know, mm -hmm. those, everyone says they're worth a lot of money. Well, they're actually shit, <laughs> okay, those pickups. they You can't play low notes on those guitars. It's mud. It's like, <laughs> you can't play low notes. The Stratocasters sound real good on low notes, you know, the bass strings. Mm-hmm. 
So I said to myself, look, I can't play Stratocasters. They have 21 frets. You can't play behind the bridge, which is a technique I invented. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't have that. The guitar sits funny on you. It's got a big heel, so you can't reach the high notes. It's a bolt-on neck. It it sits over to the right on your body, forcing your left arm into your body. It's everything I don't like. So I can't play them sitting, standing up. Sitting down, not so bad. So what am I going to do? I like that Strat sound because of the low strings, what right. it does. But I play SGs. I'm going to try to put those pickups in SGs. So well, that's, is that the what's the downside you hear? to doing that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it breaks the neck. <laughs> so you uh, have to be really careful because you have to route the pickup hole differently, and all of a sudden you're eating away a heck of a lot of wood that was holding the neck to the body. Oh, shit. Yeah, I'm looking at my SG right now. Yeah. So when you have those two extra ears on the side of the strat pickup, they're longer, and then you got to cut wood all the way around and deeper. It's like, whoops, now nothing's holding that neck anymore. So I had to be real careful about that. And even till today, if I didn't use such light strings, say I used tens or something, which a lot of guys do, that probably break the neck right off. So you have like to an use eighth lights. of an inch of wood, literally an eighth of an inch of wood holding the neck on. Oh, so you your strings are really light, so there's less pressure, less tension, and that yeah. can true. So are those literally Strat pickups? Yeah. Wow. Well, they're Demarzio, they're Demarzio's version of them. Yeah. But they're standard, not you know hot rail or yeah. extra this or that. It's standard. I said to to this guy Blucher at Demarzio when I finally decided to try Demarzio because originally I put real Strat pickups in, mm -hmm. didn't like the single coil hum. Right. Single coil pickups hum. Right. So I, someone said, try DeMarzio's. They have a single coil version that is noiseless because it's got two stacked coils. I went, okay, I'll give it a try. So he's this guy I called. I said, I'd like, he says, I says, what do you have that's just, I don't want anything fancy. I want it to be a strap pickup. Okay, nothing special. I don't like the idea of someone saying special. Okay, we have these. Vintage whatever. So I got those and put them in. That's and, what it is. And that's what you mean. Noiseless using. versions of my of my strat pickups in my SG. And then you had to modify the knobs. Well, that's yeah, because I needed to have three three volume controls, mm -hmm. right, uh, three knob controls because I wanted it wired the same. I didn't want special wiring. Mm. But then it was so um let's say weak because they're weaker, you know, the high strings are weaker. Right. That I said, well, let's put a little preamplifier in the guitar right at the jack. Okay. Right? And I put a battery in the back of the guitar, and then I can turn that switch on to the fourth knob is simply the volume of how much I'm boosting. But that, I stopped using that way, way long ago because I started using wireless in 1976. Okay. 77. So... Once I used wireless, I can't drive the wireless transmitter with that booster. It'll oversaturate the transmitter. So I never used that extra fourth knob again. I just didn't bother to take it out. Wow. And you did all these mods yourself? Of course. Wow. T talk about the the amps that you make. Okay. And just like... Uh, because there's a lot of gear nerds listening to this. Yeah, okay. That's a good good place to go. What most people don't know, everyone talks to me about the Black Live album, 77, you know, yep. Johnny B. Good, King B, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Wow, love your sound. For the entire 70s, until the 80s, my sound was an acoustic 270 transistor amplifier. Now, people say, that's not possible. <laughs> How? You didn't use tubes? No, I didn't use tubes. Why? Because my sound was created on my pedal board. I had a very uh, big pedal board in those days. That was my sound. So once I created my sound on my pedal board, I needed an amplifier that would simply make my pedal board louder. I didn't want the amp to add its own distortion or make its own sound. I wanted it to be neutral and just be able to be louder. So my sound is built on the pedal board, which that's my preamp effectively, the pedal board. Right. And the amp was serving as a power amp. Acoustic 270 happened to be a very clean transistor amp that was very loud. Wow. So that's what I used. So 
later on, I have to have four roadies to walk my pedal board around. It was ridiculous. It was six <laughs> feet long. Three feet t- t- uh, wide and sometimes two tiers high. It was ridiculous. I literally, the case that it went in would look like a coffin. <laughs> so it was like, I can't keep doing this. It's one of those, here's the good news and here's the bad news about this. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so And it was getting bigger all the time. There's 22 pedals at one point on it. So I said, you know what? I can't do this. So I'm going to have to build an amp that sounds like my pedal board, right? So I'm, how am I going to build it? Transistor amps, very hard to make them sound that way. So I'm going to build a tube preamp mm-hmm. based on a Fender twin, right. but modified, but based on a twin. And it's going to sound like my pedal board. And I worked on that for a long time. Now, there was a guy in Montreal that was already modifying twins. I started with what he did, and I didn't like it so much. It was okay for some things, not for others. So I started modifying it, and then I learned how to do it differently, and then I learned how to design it. And so gradually, I have developed my own version of my preamp. And what it is, it's basically a Fender topology, like a typical Fender topology, with slight differences in the second and third channels, which are overdrive channels. And that's my sound. So now I just plug that preamp into any clean power amp, which I still use a transistor power amp to this day, except instead of a acoustic, which has its own preamp built in, I use a crown or a QSC or any power amp that is simply clean and loud. So now my sound is all shaped in my preamp, which is a copy of my pedal board, was and my pedal board is now less pedals than was necessary and it's smaller how many how many pedals are you down to from 22 well i I have a lot of functions on the board but let's give you an example the board's only three feet long you know not even maybe 28 inches long and foot and a half wide so what have i got a wawa volume pedals uh, I've got a pedal that I built to create my backwards effect that I do live. Mm-hmm. I play backwards, forwards, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, then I've got delay, a chorus, um, uh, octave, um, what else? Echo, lots of delay, and overdrive. That's it. So it's pretty conventional. There's a lot of switches on it still. Like there's one part that has a lot of switches, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve switches in one box. Good lord, man. But that's because the switches simply to turn my pedals on in different orders. Okay. I get you. You know, getting, you put a yeah. booster before a Wawa or after and it's a different thing, right? Yeah, totally. So it's just variations of let's face it, on pedals, what have we got? We got distortion or not, right? And modulation or not, right? Delay or not, and octave or not. What else is there? Yeah, there is really nothing else. It's, it's all vari- variable on that. In the case of my reverse pedal, that's different. I have to, but I have to work that pedal. I have to create the effect as I play. Okay, it's not just to plug in and sounds reverse. So that's another version of a pedal, you know. Have you ever thought of like going into your not going into the pedal business, but selling pedals or you know licensing them or your amps? Because some you because you're. I'm asked. I'm asked. Yeah, I'm asked about that all the time. I'm sure. I really don't want to do it, and the reason I don't want to do it is because I don't want to be an amp maker or pedal maker, like sitting around doing that. And so, so then some friends of mine who do this uh, for a living. They said, well, you know, we just have to get them made here, get them, get the boards made here, or blah, blah, blah. And I go, well, wait a minute. Everything I build is one-on-one. Like, no two sound alike. Yeah. If I build two preamps, they're slightly the same, but they're not exactly the same. If I build two distortion boxes, they're slightly the same. They're not exactly the same, because I literally listen to them as I'm building them. Okay. I have an idea for a design. I say, okay, I'm going to use 10K over 200K, whatever here for a voltage divider. I don't let's see what it sounds like. And all oh, uh, it was better if it was 12 K, you know, and then yep. I change it, you know, but my ear is the judge. Sure. I get that. So what, you know, going into a business, all of a sudden I'm Frank hyphenated the pedal maker. 
<laughs> I got enough hyphens, you know? <laughs> Good to see you answering the phone, Frank Marino Pedals. Can I help you? <laughs> yeah, no, it's just not going to happen. I mean, I, I have no problem against doing it. Like, it's not like, no, I won't do it. Yeah, it's just, it's just that, not your thing, man. I get it. It's, yeah, like, I don't, you know, I'd like to do it, <laughs> but I don't want yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Touche. Yeah. That was good. That yeah. was good. No, I hear it. You can't, that's the kind of thing you can't do 50%. That's the problem with that, you know? And yeah. so if it's not something that you really enjoy, don't, you know, it's like do it's like being a, a, a part-time accountant or a part-time surgeon. It's not really something you could do like that. You gotta, gotta. I used to race, I built race cars, you know, mm. dragsters. And uh, I loved it. But, I, you know, sometimes we have to make tools because right. we were running types of cars that didn't have a tool for that. There's no tool for this. There's no tool for that. So you'd have to make the tool, get on a lathe, make the tool, you know, yeah. that'll do the job. So this is akin to making the tools. Yeah. It's a pain in the ass unless you're hundred like, percent. You do it. Yeah. Then the tool is great. You're glad you have it. Use the right tool for the job. I don't use my preamp for everything I do. Right. If somebody says to me, Frank, I want you to play on my country record. I don't use my preamp. Sure. I might get myself a Gibson, you know, combo amp and mic it because it's got to be authentically that country sound from the 50s, you know? Mm. But the tool, right tool for the job and for what Frank does, blues, rock, jazz, psychedelic, um, my, my preamp does that. So that's great. I have Marshalls. Do I use them? Eh, once in a while when you want that marshall -y sound. I even built one that's a Fender and Marshall. It's basically a twin and a plexi. Wow. And you flick one switch and the amp changes from a twin to a plexi. See, now that's the million dollar ticket right there, except it would probably take you four months to put one of those together. No, it's not that. It's that it's super expensive. Oh. That's why it would never sell because you're basically building both amplifiers and then you're building a way of making it rewire itself with the flick of a switch. Wow. Because it's not just a question of changing a couple of components. But that's the nirvana for like guitar, for tone junkies, you know. The, yeah, that's you know. the kind of thing I do because I like to invent things and I like to see if they'll work. So I invent things to see if they'll work. And then when they work, I never do anything with them. I've done that with a lot of stuff. Okay. A lot, and I have nothing, a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with music. So I, I once invented a... A little, I like the game of hockey and that before video games came along, I thought, what, would, what if we had a radio controlled hockey player that kids could play with that would skate and shoot the puck, <laughs> you know, cause they had radio controlled cars and airplanes, right? Yep. So I built one of these things and saw that it worked and great, it works. And that was the end of that. I put it in a closet. <laughs> it's like I never did anything with it. So I do that a lot. I do. I invent a lot of things, build them to see if they'll work find out that they do or don't and then say, okay, next. Yeah. But you're My a tinkerer. Kids, this is a, this is a sense. great story. This is a great story. My kids in grade six or seven, when they were in elementary, they had a science fair at their elementary school. Mm -hmm. And they said, dad, you know, we have to build something for the science fair, for the science fair. You know, <laughs> I said, okay, I got an idea. Why don't we build a levitation device? <laughs> They said, they said, wow, really? So, yeah, so I built this thing that basically levitates a ball in midair. And it's really cool when you see this ball sitting in midair spinning, okay? Yeah. So they took it to school. This is the funny part of it. They took it to school, and all the, you know, the, judge, the teacher judges, they walk by judging the science fair stuff that the kids have brought in. Uh -huh. They were walking by this thing like it didn't, they didn't care. It was like, oh, yeah, a ball. <laughs> it's like they didn't even realize they were looking at magnetic levitation. That's weird. In real time, and 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 I think the prize went to the kids who made makeup or something. <laughs> made makeup out of plants. That's it weird. was just really something. And I thought this is so amazing. And I still have this device. And like when friends come over, I'll say, "Hey, I want to show you something real cool." And and I bring out this device and then put the ball in the middle, and all of a sudden it floats and starts spinning in the air. Now, people that see that at the house, they go, holy mackerel, that's amazing. It's really an electronic principle. It's not that amazing. It's basically the ball is trying to fall, and the magnet's pulling it up 
before it can fall, and then the magnet's letting go before it can come up. Okay, well, that's so, pretty cool. Uh, something levitating, man. That's not like that's a pretty yeah. Cool because thing. think about it: if, if something wants to fall, right, but a magnet won't. A magnet wants to pull it up. If you turn a magnet on and off fast enough, it will never have time to fall or move. Right, right. It'll want to go in both directions, right? So it's a question of building a circuit that electronically makes the magnet smoothly flip its polarity or turn on and off, right? And then, of course, any ball will sit there. It's not magic, just electronics. So I thought, hey, the kids would get a great kick out of this because I'm sure they've never seen a ball floating, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they didn't get it. (laughs) The teachers didn't get it. The kids liked it. The teachers were like, oh, yeah, isn't that cute? And then they'd move on to the next table. It was like so weird. And they gave it to the exploding volcano with baking soda. Well, it was, I think, I think the, yeah, yeah, exactly. I think, I think the kids that won it or something or got the prize were the kids that had built um, makeup made out of plants or something, you know, eye makeup made out of, I don't know what, vegetables. So, you know, that's science, man. I love science. It's great. Yeah. You know? And um, I invent things. So the amps are just another thing I invent. The pedals. I just like to invent things. What's the um, yeah. best guitar? This is a, a kind of a what if question. What's the best guitar or and best amp you've ever played? Well, mine. Okay. No, not because it's mine. Because yeah. I built it to be that. Yeah. But let's say I had to tell you not mine. Yeah, sure. What let's say it's mean? coming to your house. And I wasn't bringing my amp. <laughs> and you said, Frank, we're going to jam. We're going to have fun at my house because I love that. I like that more than a gig. Right. If you said to me, Frank, come over, we're going to jam. I'd say, right. I'm, I'm there. Awesome. Okay? If you said, Frank, come over, we're going to gig, I might say, nah. <laughs> but Frank, come over, we're going to play in my basement. Right. I'd be, I'm there. What time? Awesome. I'm still like that kid, okay? That's great. So if, I, if you said, but Frank, what do you, I'll get you an amp. I'd, what should I get you? I'd say get me a twin. A Fender twin. And make sure it's a 65, 66, 67 old twin. That's a blackface. Yeah, blackface, of course. Okay, so I, I listen, anyone out there's got a blackface to sell me. If it's not a if it's cheap, I'll buy it. There you go. Frank you know, Marino. So uh, yeah, but uh, but listen, these guys that have it, it's like I want a thousand dollars. No thanks. I'm not interested. <laughs> I can build it for way less, so but if you've got a fair price and you want to sell your blackface, I'll buy it. And will you give them a copy of the DVD? Sure. Yeah, there I'll you go. And let me tell you, this yeah. is we're making I'll, magic. I'll teach them how to play "Ain't Dead." I'll teach them how to play "Ain't Dead" yet. How's Whoa! That? Personally, this is <laughs> like if you have a, a a Fender Blackface Twin '65 through '67. Mm-hmm. This is a rare mm-hmm. opportunity. Yeah, that's, that's imagine a, that ain't that's gonna, gonna happen. That's a, that's a good, that's a great <laughs> offer. And what about guitars? Yeah, gonna, what guitar guitars? Would, you, would you want me to? When I tell you, man, like I like a lot of guitars. Guitars for me are not uh, what they are for a lot of guys. You know, this is my baby. Yeah. No, it's not my baby. It's a piece of wood with strings on it. Okay. Sure. As long as the neck feels small enough, has the right arc to it, you know, easy to play, easy to play. That's the key. Yeah. Okay. I'll play that. It doesn't. People think I have a love affair with SGs because they're SGs. I have a love affair with SGs because I like the feel of the neck. But if someone built an SG, and some guys have, they've built me SGs. I play those too. It doesn't have to say Gibson on it. I don't care sure. if it says Fisher Price on it. I'll play it if I like the feel. Right, right. Um, I, I, I like. I have an SG and I actually love it the way it feels. Um, but I'm not a really big guy, tall. Like I've got, I'm an average, I'm five nine. My hands, yeah, are I'm average. five eight. Yeah, okay. So yeah, the, that neck is really perfect, man. I, I mean, yeah, I love thin. That neck. And as a matter of fact, the SG you're playing, Craig, probably has a fatter neck than mine because the old ones that I have from '61, they're really small. Well, guess what? Those the, necks are thin, man. The one I have. It's like a 2011, 12, or 13, and it's a reissue mm. of a 61. So yeah, but the, they're not right. Oh, really? They're not right. Gibson came to my house. They were going to do a Frank Marino guitar. Yeah, wh- yeah why don't they have and, a Frank and, I, and they came all the way from Nashville to my house because I said, I have original 61 Les Paul SGs. Come and see them. Come and see how different yours is. 
your reissue. So they literally came from Nashville to my house, spent two days with me, measuring my guitar and looking at the one they were selling. And I said, how did, you know, the guy said to his partner at the time, how did we get it so wrong? Wow. What, what, what is, it's the one they did is thicker or it's wider? The one you have, yeah. I, and I made sure the day they came, I told my nephew, Mike, who, who happens to work for Ibanez and music stores, mm-hmm. I said, get me one of those SG reissue 61s because when these guys come over, I want to show them the difference, not just tell them the difference. Sure. So we had one here and they came in and they looked and said, this is what you're, you know, you're offering right now. This is what I play. Now take a look at the difference. And they, the body on yours is thicker. The weight is heavier. The heel is bigger. The neck is wider. The neck is thinner front to back at the bottom and at the first fret. They're completely a different feel. Interesting. My guitar is lighter, thinner, thinner at the neck, not as wide. Um, everything about it is like a, a thinner version, a, like a, a formulaic formula car version of what they're selling. Yeah, sure. But I said to them, and I'm saying if, if there's anyone from Gibson, cause I know they got taken over now by a, a cool guy. Cause the guy that was running it before was a real idiot. Yeah. Um, but they got taken over and this new guy says that he wants to take the company back in the direction they used to be instrument maker. Okay. Cause at one point it looked like they were selling Apple iPhones. <laughs> okay, it had nothing to do with instruments anymore. You, know, you went to Na- I was told that a guy went to Nam and he saw the booth and you couldn't even see guitars in their booth. You had to go in the back room to see them. They were selling, you know, white iPhone genius bar shit. You know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I'm telling them now. I have the actual blueprints of my guitar because I blueprinted it with micrometers oh. and I drew an entire blueprint of it, like angle everything, everything. Like as much as I used to do racing engines. So the guy from Gibson is listening and he wants to really build the proper 61 reissue. I've got the goods. (laughs) Come and see me. We'll do it. This is a a rare Frank Marino's like giving away everything here. Someone's got to take advantage of this. Bring There's no a, secrets. Bring them a Fender Twin, make a, a 61. That's amazing that there's so many differences, though, on the reissue than, than from the... Look, I'm not saying the reissue isn't good. You never oh, saw yeah. the other one. So yeah. you're going to say, wow, I love it. It's great. Sure. I'm not saying you don't love it. You do love it. Mm. But it's not the same. Yeah, it's just amazing. So it's just not the same. And it's like, you know, I, we make a certain kind of Italian sauce here for our spaghetti. It's not the same as what you're going to get in the store. It doesn't mean the store's bad. Yeah, the store's it means bad. ours is better. The store is bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, but but this is it, you know. Like, it, there's no secrets here. Frank doesn't keep secrets, and oh, that's my secret sauce, and you know, well, I can't tell you what's in that pedal. And a lot of guys do that. It's like, hey, go for it, man. If it helps musicians, look, I have friends in the business that sell what you call boutique gear. Sure, right? You've you've seen those, of course, five hundred dollar fuzz tones and wawas and all this stuff. Amps, what are they? Bogner, uh, what are those amp boutique amps? Bogner's one. They got name. Bogner's one of them. There's another one there. So I say to my friends that sell these things, I say, why are you doing that? They say, why are we doing what? I says, why are you charging so much money for something that is not worth it? Why? You're calling it boutique? Is it really any different than this $50 fuzz tone? It's just made, you know, more carefully. I think he's charging $400 to a kid. I said, who do you think's making the next generation of music? It ain't blues lawyers. <laughs> okay? You're selling these things to blues lawyers. You're selling these things to guys with, you know, all kinds of extra money that they can play blues on the weekend with their band and say, I have a Bogner and I have the $400 fuzz and I have this, but they're not making any good new music. So you're killing the entire industry by not providing the good equipment to the next generation of people, which are young kids from 16 to 21. They're the ones that should be getting the Bogners. They're the ones that should be getting the great boutique fuzzes, the great guitars, because they're going to do something with it. And what have you done? You've sold them these things to blues lawyers. And all these kids are doing now is they're turning to their iPads and their iPhones, and they're trying to make music that way. You're killing music with this because you want to make an extra two or $300. I'm not telling you sell it for 50 bucks. 
but don't sell it for 450 bucks, this pedal. Sell it for 150 bucks. You're still going to make money and you're going to sell more of them. And then 16 year olds will buy them. They won't have to be mortgaging their next year's work at the, at the grocery store to get the latest, greatest pedal. And they're going to make great music and music will get better and better instead of worse and worse, which is what it's becoming. There's a reason for that. Nothing happens for nothing. So we're not putting the best equipment in the hands of the most creative people because everybody is most creative in their teenage years to their mid twenties. Yeah. That's one thing. Uh, good instruments were much more accessible back in the day. No kidding. $75 for my guitar. Yeah. Uh. And, and and it's because inflation adjusted, it's it's way, it's yeah. I know what you're saying. Man. I have 44 guitars collected wow. over the years, not just SGs. I've never paid more than three or four hundred bucks for one. Good for you, man. So you obviously collected most of them quite a while ago. Even recent, less recently as the '90s, my Strat I got for what was it, four fifty, five hundred dollars, or something like that. Mm. It was in the window of a store. I went to a store, my second Strat. I got the '62, but I also have this '93. So I went to a store. Hey, I think I'll look at Stratocasters. You know, I only have the one, and let's see what they're like. Blah blah blah. You know. Do you still so get the bug the store, to do that? By the way. Yeah, once in a while. So yeah. I go in the store. I say to the guy. Uh, show me the Stratocasters. He starts bringing me down the Stevie Ray, this and this, that boutique, this and that. And I'm, I'm playing him. Nah, I don't like it. Gives me another one. Nah, I don't like it. Nah, I don't like it. I just didn't like it. And I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Okay. It's like I want, must have gone through 25, 30 guitars. I'm leaving the store. I look to the left and in the window, there's this purple Stratocaster, <laughs> literally standing there with like a price tag on it on sale new kind of American standard. Mm -hmm. I go, oh, hey, I didn't try that one. The guy says, oh, no, you don't want that, Frank. You don't want that. That's that's you know, that's you nothing. That's, I said, no, no, well, I'm here now. Let me try it. So I go back in the store, take my coat off. It was winter. Plug it in, and it was amazing. I was like, awesome. wow, why didn't you tell me this one was here? He goes, yeah, but Frank, it's just a cheap. I says, I'll buy it. And I walked out with it, and that album I have, Eye of the Storm, mm -hmm. it's the first time I ever did an entire album with a Stratocaster, and that's the Stratocaster wow. I used. There's only, one, there's only one song on that record where I used my SG for a solo, and that's just for one solo. Everything else was done with that purple Strat right out of the store with the strings I had on the guitar. That's a really cool story, man. So, yeah, you can find them, but people are always trying to direct people away to the more expensive stuff and the more expensive stuff is not necessarily the best. You know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Price is, now, is not always an indicator of value. It's most of the time it is good. If you pay more, you get better, but sometimes you're paying more than the more because it's better. Right. Well, sometimes you get they like, hope. I mean, to make it like a real simple, like I, I enjoy cigars. Right. And yeah. you know, once you get over like eight, nine ten dollars it does you know yeah. there are forty dollar cigars out there i mean they're really not better in my opinion anyway it's just like throwing good money after bad you know so um and i think instruments or everything there's a threshold sort of similar i mean we have to craig do you care about music yeah of course very much then we have to get the kids doing more music yeah that's if we really wanted to survive it has to get into their hands. They are the generation that will take it to better, better places. But now they're being diverted by Facebook and this and that and all this other stuff. Not even talking to each other anymore. Guy asked me the other day, he says, what did you find is the most different thing today <laughs> compared to when you were young? I said, you know what it is? When I open the window today, I don't hear anyone outside playing. It's that like is, a mausoleum out man, there. That is very true. That is really I don't hear really anyone true. saying, Johnny, Bobby, come on over, ba, 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 and hearing yeah. the baseball crack or whatever. 
I heard that all the time. You used to have to close the window. Yeah, that is really true. Today, go ahead, go open your window. What do you hear? Nothing, man. No, it's. If you're it's... in a quiet neighborhood, you hear quiet, and if you're in a non-quiet neighborhood, you hear cars. Yeah. But you don't hear anybody playing or interacting, and then they come over to the house, kids and whatever, friends of friends, and they're talking to each other on the phone while they're in the same room, yeah. texting. Yes. So there's no personal thing going on anymore. Nobody's personal. Nobody's looking at each other's eyes. Nobody's talking to each other. Is there any wonder they're not coming up with any good ideas? <laughs> because ideas are not the don't come from one person. They come from the culmination of people working yeah. together. There's a prompt. Yeah, there's a prompt that some they get from somewhere and then that takes them in the direction. Yeah. That's why and, bands are called bands. Yeah. Well, and not me's. You know, like they're, they're bands. Uh, tough question. Maybe not. If you know, I don't, you, I don't, maybe not any, not a tough question. Um, you're really a very introspective man. And I appreciate that about you. What do you like most about yourself, Frank? Like about myself. Maybe I maybe I said that pre too too soon. <laughs> it doesn't occur to me. Okay, I'll think about it. Let me let me think about it here. What do I like most about myself? Um, nah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I used to say my hair. No, I'm just kidding. You do have good um, hair, man. No, I but, did. You know, but. Uh, I'm older now, so. <laughs> hey, man, you've, but, uh, you've you seen a picture of me? What do I like most about myself? I don't know, Craig. I'd have to ask my wife that. No, 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 Denise, no, what, what, no. what do I like most about myself? No, man, you know. Think oh, I'll it. tell you one. There's one thing I like about myself. Yes, I do like this about myself. I like that I can see the good things in bad things. So you're an optimist. Well, I, I've been accused of being a pessimist, but it's not really pessimism in my case when I'm, here's what I tell people. I tell people, look, doubt is a, doubt is a, is a terrible thing, right? So doubt sort of makes things worse, you know, but doubt is a funny thing. It's something that people feel they have to express. Like, in, in other words, it's rather like if you saw a UFO, it wouldn't be good enough to say, I saw a UFO to yourself. You've got to go tell people, hey, I saw a UFO. It's something you have to express. You feel you have to tell people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And doubt is the same way. Doubt is no good if you just feel it. Doubt is the kind of thing people want to say, I won't win. I bought a lottery ticket, but I don't have a chance. They feel they need to express it. And that's valid. It's okay. I don't say people shouldn't express their doubts. They should because it's a way of feeling better. But there's a way to express doubt and get the same feeling that you let it out of your system without actually saying you doubt. And all you have to do is instead of doubting something, just hope for the opposite. So it's like you're expressing a doubt that you don't believe the opposite will happen, but you're framing it as hope. So don't say, I bought a lottery ticket, but I'll never win. Just say, I bought a lottery ticket. I hope I win. So hold on a minute. People say, oh, I'll never, you know, there's no heaven. I doubt there's a heaven. But you could say, I, I hope, hope there there's is. a heaven. It's you're kind of saying you doubt it, but you're expressing it as hope. So how does this relate to that you could see the good things and bad things, which is what you said you like most about yourself? Because in every bad thing, I know that old expression, the silver lining, dark cloud, blah, 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 sounds like a slogan, but it's actually true. You know, God is very good at making lemonade out of lemons. <laughs> if you think about the bad things that have happened in the world that have resulted in good things, I think the penultimate version of that is the crucifixion of Jesus. I mean, it's a pretty bad thing. It turned yeah. into a pretty good thing. Okay. Life forever and all that stuff. So I like to try to practice that. And that's why religion is called a practice. It's not like you're an expert. <laughs> you got to practice that. So how do I practice? I see something bad that happened. I hope for the better part. I'm hoping and I'm trying to feed hope into everything. I spent eight years fixing this DVD. Eight years 
sitting in a chair 12 hours a day. I didn't do it in my spare time. What ha- ha- but what every happened? day I hoped I could fix it. So why did you have I to didn't spend- say I'll never do it. What what happened with the DVD you had to spend 8 years fixing it? Like these guys came along. I never wanted to do a DVD. I don't you know, I never believed in video. Okay, like for music. I thought it kind of takes away from the music, but whatever. Everyone's doing it, you know? Mm-hmm. So they kept telling me for 10 years, 15 years, you are the only guy I never did a video. You never did a video. You never did a video. Why don't you do a video? I kind of don't like it. So finally, these guys who happen to be video makers through a weird series of events, there's a book in my DVD that it goes through the whole explanation. So I'm going to give it all away. I hope people read the book. It's 180 pages, this book. And so, you, so you put that together yourself too, right? Yeah, well, the journalist wrote the first bunch of chapters, and I wrote the last 20 in the book. So, But the point is this. A, a weird series of events took place. Some very you know, cool people came along and said, if you're not going to do the video, we'll do it for you. It only came about because of the weird series of events. Hmm. So I said, okay, you, they did it for me as a gift. So I said, okay, if we're going to do one, we're going to do one all day, 12 hours long. We'll play as many songs as we can. I'm not going to do one again. I'll never do another video. I'm telling people this now. Right. Never. This is it. And they said, okay. And they came and they did it. And it was a gift. And I was so grateful that they did it. And then they handed it to me. And it was like, wow, what a gift. And I began to thank God for this wonderful opportunity. And after I thank God for this wonderful opportunity, for directing these people to do this, I found out it was damaged. So after all that had happened, I had this beautiful thing that was uh, the audio on it at one point, at, for a certain point, the drums were completely gone. It was unusable. Now, there was really two choices. Fix it or throw it out. Now, what would my gratitude mean that I had expressed if I just threw it out? Yeah, not much. Right. So now I said, I'm going to fix it to show gratitude. But I didn't know it would take eight years. And how did you I fix thought it? Would it take like one year. How did you fix, like, for example, drum tracks? I began to figure out how to do it as I went through it. And I began to figure out exactly how bad it was and why all the experts told me don't bother because it's impossible. Because I did. I consulted people to see about resurrecting audio that's damaged. It's just nothing but crackles. Okay. And they said, no, it can't be done. I said, you mean to tell me in this age of computers, we're doing stuff like that, but not to that degree. Okay. How do I fix it? I got to figure out a way because I said I'd fix it. What am I supposed to say? I'm sorry I didn't mean it. <laughs> the man makes a promise to God. He doesn't turn around and say, ah, I, I was just kidding. Yeah, yeah. So now I said, I'm going to fix it. So I said to myself, well, I'll try one bar. I got a plan about how to do it. Made sounds, blah, 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 editing. I'm a good editor. And I fixed one bar. That's probably, in retrospect, the thing that made me finish. Because what if I hadn't fixed the one bar? I would have known it was impossible. You but mean if I fixed one, one bar, bar of music? Yeah, one bar. Oh, my God. And I said, hey, I just fixed one bar, and it's perfectly okay. I resurrected the bad audio. Holy shit. Took a lot to do it. Took a month. But it did. So I said, well, now I got to do bar two. So that was your project. And it was a 12 hour day. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) So I did. So what did it do? Winter came, summer came, winter came, summer came, winter came, summer came every year, man. And I just sat there, get up every day, stumble down to the chair. Start again. Stumble down to the chair until I went to sleep that night. Go back to sleep. No career, no gigs, no recordings, nothing. Saw my daughters grow up in the next room and uh, finished it. And this was my give back. This was my, I said I'd do it. I love you. I mean it when I say that to him. And here it is. You don't need it. 
but this is my way of saying thanks. So you said it was originally, it originally 12 hours and it, you're, it you're, broke down to six. six it broke hours. down to six in the end. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. Of, six of solid music, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing, man. What, um, that's the story behind it. It's, it's really a unique thing. It's once in a lifetime thing. That's why I'll never do another one. I've got no reason to do another one. I'm not trying to sell. I'm not trying to create a career here. I'm trying to conclude one. <laughs> I like how you said that. Um, yeah, it's it's. I'm I'm going to be 65 years old. I don't agree in rock musicians in tight leather pants at 75. I think it's unseemly. <laughs> Go home, man. You want to hear? This is a funny story. We um um. Obviously, through the show, I meet a lot of nice people. And when guys come through town, they're very kind and they give me tickets to come to shows. And most of the time, we go backstage and we're hanging out. So we went to this show. Um, I don't know if you know Dave Amato. He's with Ario Speedwagon, long time. Mm, don't know him, but I know of him. So we go, and my wife had never been backstage. And I'm 55, and she's like a year older than me. And uh, she's backstage. And she's looking out, and there's all these people which you know about. They're all our age, yeah. But all these women are like throwing themselves at the stage, and she said, and mm -hmm. she couldn't. She goes, "What's going on here? All these women wear they're wearing like you know they're our age, and you know just because they make it in a size two doesn't mean you need to wear it in a size two kind of thing, right? Exactly, right. <laughs> and it just reminded me of just what you said, and, and <clears throat> but it's true. Look. <laughs> We some of these musicians look. I don't want to get them mad at me. They're going to get mad at me. I don't mean all of them, but some of them. Yeah. It reminds me of that old story of the kids down in the part having a party in the basement, and the uncle comes down, wears a lampshade, and thinks he's cool. Right, right. <laughs> and tries to get in with the hip kids, you know. <laughs> and they're all laughing and everything. Yeah, yeah. He's so your uncle's so cool, but believe me, when he goes upstairs, it's like what an idiot. Yeah. OK, so it has to come to a point where you have to say to yourself, look, you want to keep, keep making music by all means, keep making music. You're never too old to do that. Sure. Uh, you're never too old. You can do it till you're 100, 150 if you live that long. And it's great. The music can be great. But at some point, stop with the, you know, pretending you're a 20 year old rock star. You're not. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. You know, you're not. And it looks weird. It's it's odd. Like it's a, to me, it's it's comical. <laughs> And it has some dignity. Oh, my God. And, you, and, and so a lot funny. of them, you know, you ever notice this? The ones that do that are actually the ones that don't need the money. They're all at $300 million and $500 million. <laughs> they don't need the money. So what are you doing it for? What, are you so afraid of being irrelevant that you got to go out and make a fool of yourself? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, man. I don't know. So that's the way I look at it. It's like, you know what? You want to do it, do it. But you're going to get me to do it. So if I go out and tour again, the only way I'll go out and tour again is if I earn enough money on the DVD to do it because I don't have managers, I don't have record companies, I don't have agents. I do, you know, so I have to do it myself. So let's say I happen to sell enough DVDs that I can go out and do some gigs. I'll go out and do some gigs, but I'm not going to go out and do gigs acting like I'm 21 years old. You mean the leather pants will not come with you? No, my, the, suit, the clothes I wear on that DVD are what I wear every day. Okay. That's me. Right. Okay. That's me. That's Frank. It's not a costume. I get you. Know? It. Yep. I totally get but, it. But, yeah. But that's just the way I am. And if you look at my closet, I wear clothes like that, you know, I get it. but, uh, but I'm not going to go out there, you know, Hey, how y'all doing? And oh boy. And look at all the chicks and all that, that stuff. You know, it's, <laughs> it's unseemly. Come on. Keith Richard needs to grow up, <laughs> you know? Really? At least he should learn to play guitar. Oh, Frank. Remember in the beginning you said, I'm not, I never felt at home in these big crowds of people. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. No, I mean, I'll get in a lot of trouble for saying what I say, yeah. but who cares? Yeah. I mean, I'm not wrong. I'll, look, I'll, there's a hell of a lot more people. If I say this and you happen to put this on the radio or whatever, mm -hmm. There's a lot more people nodding their heads saying he's right <laughs> than the few who are saying, oh, what did he say? Yeah, it's just not a it's lot of... It's true. It's just obvious. A lot of people wouldn't say that. 
It's yeah, because they're afraid they got something to lose, right? So there's this whole politically correct thing today. You can't say this, you can't say now you don't even know which words you can't say. You gotta to subscribe to a newsletter to see which words are now allowable. Yes, of course. And which words are not. It's ridiculous. <laughs> okay? Come on. The word dog never bit anyone. <laughs> oh my you know, like God. it's but that's the way it's become. People have, they want to live that way. Great. More power to you. I, I say live and let live. You want to live that way. You want to subscribe to that type of thinking. More power to you. God bless you. Do what you want. You want to limit your speech. You want to limit your thoughts. You want to join group think groups. Go ahead. Have at it. <laughs> that ain't me. Okay. That ain't me. It never was. If it was me, do you think I would have left the biggest record company in the world at the height of my career playing giant stadiums and walked away like I did in 83 and said, I'm not doing this anymore. What was behind that decision? The business. Yeah. You just couldn't take bullshit. It. Yeah. It was like, what am I doing? You know, when they, when, when that old joke that somebody gets to Dorothy's, Oh, this is in Kansas. Yeah. You know, I mean, I got to the music industry thinking I was going to Woodstock and I got there and it was anything but Woodstock. Right. Okay. You know, with the camaraderie and the peace and the love and all this stuff that I thought it was going to be, all it was, was backbiting and, and people trying to be better than the next guy and saying expressions I'd never heard before. I didn't know what they meant. You know, we're going to blow him off the stage. And I thought, what does that mean? Yeah. And why are these why are these people in the industry not just happy enough to be good or to be accepted or to have their niche of fans, but they almost have to say that the other guy shouldn't have any? Yeah, I don't know why people you are know? like that. Yeah, I don't. That's you know how many times I did shows with multiple bands when the bands that were on the show would go out of their dressing rooms. And go stand behind beside the stage to hear how much of an encore the other band got. And if they didn't get a good one, they'd come back smirking. Wow, really? Come on, that was standard fare in our industry. So you just got sick of all of this? Yeah, come on. First of all, I kind of expected to get it from the from the business people, from the bean counters. Because let's face it, they're bean counters, right? Sure, yeah. And I kind of expected to get it from the writers who write in magazines because those who can't do usually write about it. I kind of expected yeah. that. And that's not so bad. That's what they do. It's like yeah, I yeah, expect I tigers to eat meat. Yeah, so yeah, they don't go in their cage. But I didn't expect it from a lot of the musicians because I thought they were thinking like I did. Like we're all and they this together rising. Now, some were. I'm not telling you they're all like that. Yeah. Believe me, they're not all like that. That's Don't get me wrong here. But there's such a plethora of them that it's like it seems like they're all like that you know what they say empty barrels make the most noise <laughs> so so and you were i saw it everywhere and i was like it's like the volkswagen thing i began to see it everywhere and it was very yeah. negative it's turning me into a negative person and in, in i don't your, like to be negative so i walked away in in your mind you were of more of the mindset of rising tide lifts all boats. We're all in this together. Let's support. Let's push. Absolutely. Let's and I'm change. still like that. Yeah. So if ever, when I was headlining shows, okay, when I, when I got to the point where I could headline big shows and it was really only word of mouth because I never had the radio help. So when that finally happened and I started doing my own things, do you think I ever treated opening acts the way they treated us? And yet we'd have crew, you'd get to a gig and it seemed almost normal for the crew, you know, the Ayatsi guys or the crew to treat the other acts like they were crap. They really? push their gear to the front of the stage. They'd make sure they didn't use all the sound system. They'd make sure they couldn't use all the lights. There was always this limitation they were putting on the opening acts. They, they wanted the headliner to be louder and bigger and brasher and more amazing than the acts before. And I didn't think that way because that happened to me all the time. Almost every, I did a lot of opening gigs. So when I would work with these other bands, it was like, use what you need, play what you want, use the lights, use my amps if you want. I don't care. Use the sound. You want a sound check? I'll get off stage so you can have one. You know, it's interesting. I, I think just, this is just my exposure. I'm not in the business. I just hear things from other people I'm talking to. But I've talked to a you know 600 people over the last two years. I think it might be a little different now because I'm more often than not to hear so-and-so is so gracious to us. Um, 
they let us do this. They got off. They let us do. Now, maybe I'm just hearing that. I hope. I hope that's happening. Yeah. I'm, I don't know if it's happening now. I don't tour anymore. Right. But I'm telling you what happened when wow. I toured. That's terrible. Maybe it man. got better. But well, by the time I walked away, it wasn't better. Yeah. It was worse. And, and, and then throughout the 80s, I started doing my own gigs at clubs and small places. That way... I didn't have to deal with all that nonsense. I wasn't on a label anymore. I didn't have to deal with that nonsense. You know, and don't forget, when I walked away from Columbia, a lot of people don't know this. There was it was the option for the next album was my option, not the record company's option. Oh wow. I could have exercised it. I could have said, Well, I'm gonna do the last album and that's it and taken the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And you didn't. No, I walked away. You were just that disgusted. Yeah, that disgusted. Oh. And so what do you think happened? My crew got mad at me. My band members got mad at me. Everybody got mad at me. What are you doing, man? What are you doing? It's great. We're, we we're supposed to play this stadium. We're supposed to do this. We're supposed to have that tour. What are you doing? I don't care. Go and do it, you guys. You want to go do it? Go do it. And that's when you find out who really just wants to make music. Yeah. Who's doing it for the music, for the fun. The most fun part of touring is the sound checks and the food after you eat, after you play, going out to Denny's or something. Okay. That's the fun. That was the fun when I was a kid, when we played high school gigs, yeah. we played a lot of free gigs. And you'd go play the high school, and after you'd say, where are we going to eat with the, with the 50 bucks we made? And that was the fun. Have and you... I never changed that. I'm the same guy that I was then. I'm glad I am. Have you spoken to, you don't have, I don't, I'm not looking for names, just uh, looking for discussion. Are there other people that were relevant like you were at that time that felt the same way? Yes. Did, did some of yes. them leave as well? No. That's fear. Hmm. Yes, there was a few, quite a few. Yeah. It's a secret thing. Sure, sure. It's that, it's that, you know, well, you know, I'd like to do that, but, you know, oh, wow, that's a big decision. And I'm thinking, well, it's not that big a decision, but listen, I don't fault them. I sure. get it. Yeah, yeah, of course. I totally get it. They're still my friends. Okay. But that's just not me, man. It's not me. I'm, I'm the reluctant. I'm a very reluctant rock musician. And I always was because I come from the air, the time when there was a thing called the counterculture. Yeah. So the counterculture was like, okay, we are us and they are the man, you know, it was this yeah. whole thing with, the, with the, the government and all that stuff. They are the man and the corporations and all that. I come from that counterculture. So I figure, okay, now I'm joining a bunch of musicians in our, in our crusade against the counterculture, right? And we're going to yeah. do it with art, right? And then I find out that all these people have created a counterculture that's a culture itself is worse than the one before. And they're still hoarding the pennies and cheating their friends and doing unstealing and doing all kinds of things that are completely what we hated. But now they're dressing it up in, you know, leather and, laser light shows and and concerts used to be called concerts and then they became shows and then they became spectacles no one went to a show in 1969 they went to a concert yeah, yeah. and so this is what was i saw changing and it was really it was making me upset to the point where i was beginning to see the bad see the bad see the bad and i said you know what my outlook is don't look at this bad stuff man like there's got to be some good stuff going on here so my outlook was that. So I said, well, you know, I'm not seeing too much good here, so I need to go where I can. I need to leave it. It's like a bad relationship. Yeah, I, I, I leave it. I understand. I, I totally understand. Look, man, I, I give you a lot of credit for um, sticking to what was important to you and if something and for recognizing that something was draining you and doing something about it and not changing to adapt to the environment, you know, 
and I, and I, I have a lot of respect for you for doing that. And I know it wasn't an easy, I mean, the decision was probably easy, but the execution probably wasn't as, as easy. And, um, so I really, I give well, it was harder. Time. It was harder on, on, look, I care about the other people around me. Right. So, sure, of course. I mean, I really, I do. So it was a lot harder on everybody else. Okay. Cause I'm prepared to be broke. I'm okay with that, yeah. but I understand that not everyone is. Sure. So yes, I, it was hard on the other guys and it was hard on their girlfriends and my own, you know, but I had, I had met, you know, at that point I'd met the person who became my wife for now the past 40 years. And I was okay with that. Yeah. And she was okay with that. You know, that's the important thing, Craig. Relationships are the currency of heaven. Dude, you don't have to tell me. That's that what you twice. spend there. Yeah, you don't. That's have what to. you spend there. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. you don't have to. I, I'm I'm with you on that, man. That's all you got. So you don't. So you, that's when, what you have at the end of the day. Yeah, right? man. You're not thinking about your. To- Let me tell you, man. I am so down on that. It's not even funny. That's all that's important yeah. to me, man. And and as I've gotten older, and as I on almost a daily basis, that becomes more important to me. Because, you know, you realize, talk about currency, time is not a currency that you have as much as you used to. And I'm really, it's really important to me to fill that up with as much good stuff. And good stuff is that what you just talked about. Those relationships, those connections. Time, yeah. Time is a bank account that one has that he doesn't know the balance. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? So you better make sure it's fucking emotionally full as, as possible whenever you can. Yeah. You never know the balance. And so imagine you had a bank account, but no one told you your balance. Yeah. You keep going and dragging some money out of it and say, Oh, I was able to buy something today. But one day you're going to go there and they're going to say you're overdrawn. Yeah. You didn't know when that day was going to come. Cause you never knew the balance. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't know how much was there. Oh, so right. you're preaching to the choir. You're preaching to the choir, man. I get it. I always say you can make I, more money. Uh, you can't make more time. Yeah, and and I I say this too. No matter what you do, no matter how great you are, no matter how smart you are, no matter how loved you are, when you go, the people that come to see you on that day largely make their decision based on the weather. <laughs> okay oh my god that's true that's true and and here's the thing let's say you're just such a great person and you've done such great things that they brave the weather the inclement weather they brave the hail and they brave the snow and they come they don't come next week but your family does oh yeah and every week after so wherever you had the relationships that's your value. Oh yeah. And that's what you take with you. What are you going to tell God? I can, I'm an architect. I can build bridges. I can cure cancer. I can do all these things. Well, we don't need that here, but what we do need is relationships Mm -hmm. and the ability to get along. That's good here. That's what you need. And if you really are, whether you believe it or you don't, if you really are slated to be a being that will live forever, which is the big promise in our religion, if you really want to live forever in a bad mood, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Frank, you need a TV show, man. I, I don't know what you know. There's a, a million themes, but you need like a a t a, some sort of a TV show, man, because people will listen to you. Hey, I'm going to ask you one. First of all, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming on the show, but for being so open and sincere, man, I cannot thank you enough for, for that. I, honestly. And I mean that if I was looking you in the eye, I'd shake your hand and give you a hug. I really appreciate that very much. It means a lot to me. So thank you. Um, I want to ask you one more question and I'm going to tell people, uh, a little more about the DVD cause I want everybody to grab it. Um, and that question is what has been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years? And, and how much of that has been intentional and how much is a natural part of aging? Patience. You become more patient or less patient? Totally, totally more patient. Okay. Awesome. Ridiculously patient. 
He must be to listen to this, listen to me talking to you for two and a half hours. <laughs> no, no, really, truly, it's uh, it's ridiculous. The patience. Le- I was always a relatively patient because I was always hoping for the best type of deal, you know, mm-hmm. like trying yeah. to get out of the hospital and all that stuff. But over the last ten years, with this project, this gratitude project, the patience has become. Mm. I, I didn't even know it was possible to have that much patience. Like so you, I can literally wait and wait and wait and not be bored waiting. So you really took this to heart from a grad. So this sounds like it, you really learned a lot from this project, not just doing it. And, and now that you got a great DVD, you know, package here, but you, it sounds like you grew a lot from this, from a gratitude standpoint. Totally. Oh, yeah. oh. Absolutely. I mean, it, if anything helped my hope become more faithful, because hope feeds faith mm-hmm. and doubt destroys it. So if anything helped, it was this project. It was this the idea that the real motivation behind it genuinely every day was gratitude. It wasn't. There wasn't a single time I looked at doing this project thinking, gee, people are going to like this. Yeah. Or, wow, that's really good. Right. Or, 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 wow, I can fund my next vacation or something. Yeah, like yeah. really, truly gratitude. As a matter of fact, you want a really freak? Yeah. I told my daughters when it was done, very close with my daughters and my wife, I said to them, now, now that it's done, listen to this, I said, maybe I should just not ever put it out. Why is that? I really did this for, because I really did this for God out of gratitude, not necessarily for any other reason. Sure. And they went, no, what are you crazy? No, people have to see it. People have to see it. I said, okay, okay. I'm just like telling you my thoughts. I'm not telling you this, my plan, but it occurred to me. That's how I didn't do it. The motivation behind doing it had nothing to do with whether people would like it or sure. not like it or, or make, make money on it or whatever. And then actually it was them that told me, look, if you do it this way, dad, maybe we can go out and play some shows or something. You'll have some money to do it. Or, Cause I, you know, I don't have any money. I don't own a home. Well, you know, also- I don't have anything like that. I rent and have an old 15 year old car, you know? So they thought, Maybe you could make something happen with this and we get out there and you'll play and you'll be happy and musicians. So I thought, okay, well, well, let's see what happens. But as long as it doesn't change me, okay, there, if it starts, if something starts to change me, my value system, my principles, then I don't want to have anything to do with that. And that's what the business had been doing. It had been making me pessimistic. It had been making me look at how valuable an album was or a gig and I, I thought that's not me. That never was me. So that's why it's out there now. And listen, I want people to like it, and I do want people to buy it, and I yeah. certainly could use the money. But the but the the overriding concern is that when people do get it or buy it or whatever they do, that they actually think it is good, but not because it's good because I play good. But, you've been but it's just ton- good. You've been getting tons of good <laughs> testimonials on it, you told me. Yeah, it's yeah, just so. good stuff, you know? Good stuff. Here it is. It's good. This is what Frank did, you know? You want to see what he is? You want to hear what he is? This is it. This is the one he endorses. Not the YouTube crap that people take on their phones. I wish none of that was there. Well, man, let me summarize what we learned today. First of all, we learned that Frank would love to buy your friend or twin 65, 67 <laughs> blackface. If you give it to him at a good price in exchange, yeah. you will also get a private lesson for him where he'll teach you how to play ain't dead yet. <laughs> Let me finish. And he'll give you a box set of the Blu-ray and DVDs along with the 180 page book. We learned Frank's been married 40 years. Congratulations. You quit smoking. Congratulations. I hope that continues. And, um, why he quit the music business and walked away from Columbia. And we also learned you are a very sincere, honest guy. And I really appreciate that, man. So thank you. And let me just tell people one more time. Don't forget that I'm a Christian. And he's a Christian. He's a Christian and he's a good guy. Both of those Mm -hmm. things. 
Um, all right. The DVD is called Frank Marino Live at the Agora Theater. Go to check it out. Go to Mahogany Rush, and that's M A H O G A N Y Rush.net forward slash DVD. It's Mahogany Rush.net forward slash DVD, and check it out there. It's, um, Hundred and six, how it's six hours, man, of uh Blu ray and then three DVD. It's a Blu ray and then three DVD set. It's a 180 page book that chronicles Frank's entire career, most of it put together by him. The last 20 chapters put together by him. 58 songs on this, uh, many of which were rarely, if ever, played live. And you can also get this on or go uh, go to Frank's uh, Facebook official, Frank Marino, and you can find information about it on there. Again, it's called Frank Marino Live at the Agora Theater. And um, did I miss it? And anything? Mahogany Rush, com too, is our website. And, yeah. and MahoganyRush.com, thanks. A- yeah. Anything I missed or anything else I missed? No, no, that that about sums up the whole DVD thing. <laughs> yeah. any, any final words of wisdom, man? You're a good guy, and I really appreciate your time. Any any final words of wisdom? Yeah, it's never as bad as you think it is. <laughs> I love that. It's yeah. never as bad as you think. And it's true, man. Yeah. I, I met this guy one time, and he said, Craig, there's this four-letter word has a way of fixing absolutely everything. It's called time. Yeah. And uh, I agree with you. Frank, it's been a pleasure. Hang on. Let me wrap up and then you and I'll, let me just say goodbye to everybody and you and I'll wrap up. And really, honestly, thank you very much for everything. I, I hope you do tour because I'll be in the, in the, uh, in the, in the seats listening and enjoying it. You're very welcome. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Frank Marino for spending time with us. I'd love everybody to check out and get Frank's DVD. Again, it's called Frank Marino Live at the Agora Theater, and you can get it at mahoganyrush.net forward slash DVD or mahoganyrush.com or on Facebook, official Frank Marino. And uh, there's just tons of great stuff on there. Make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Thank you, Frank, for everything. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. 